Good evening. This is Chairwoman Jane Lichter. I now call to order the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for Tuesday, January 24th, 2023. I invite you to recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag to be led by Ms. Roa Hassan. We will then have a moment of silence in recognition of those who have served education in Baltimore County. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Tonight's Board of Education meeting is being held in person and virtually and broadcast through the BCPS online live meeting broadcast and on BCPS TV, Comcast Affinity Channel 73, Verizon Fios Channel 34. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this evening will be done by roll call vote. Oops, wait a second. The first item on the agenda is the consideration of the January 24th agenda. Dr. Williams, are there any additions or changes to tonight's agenda? I'm not aware of any additions or changes at this time. Hearing none, the agenda stands as presented. Is there, um, okay. Earlier this evening, the board met in closed session pursuant to the Open Meetings Act for the following reasons. To discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom it has jurisdiction, or any other personnel matter which affects one or more specific individuals, consult with counsel to obtain legal advice, and conduct collective bargaining negotiations or consider matters that relate to the negotiations. The summary of the closed session and open session information summary can be found on board docs under this meeting board meeting agenda date. The next item on the agenda is personnel matters, and for that I call on Mr. McCall. Good evening, Chair Lichter, Vice Chair Harvey, Superintendent Williams, and members of the board. I would like the board's consent for the following personnel matters, retirements, resignations, and certificated appointments. Do I have a motion to approve the personnel matters as presented in exhibits D1 through D3? So moved, Harvey. Do I have a second? Second, Dominowski. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Dr. Hager? Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. The next item on the agenda, the motion carries. The next item on the agenda is administrative appointments, and for that I call on Dr. Williams. Madam Chair Lichter, Vice Chair Harvey, and members of the board, I am bringing forward the following administrative appointments for your approval. Senior Operations Supervisor, Office of Transportation, Research Specialist, Office of Research, and Manager, Leaves and Employee Absence, Office of Employee Absence and Risk Management. Do I have a motion to approve the administrative appointments as presented in Exhibit E1? So moved, Hassan. Do I have a second? Second, Pumphrey. May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Jones? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. Motion carries. Dr. Williams? Our first candidate is Cheryl A. Fulmore. I think she's in the audience. Please stand as our new Senior Operations Supervisor in the Office of Transportation. Attending with her is her husband, Manzi, if he could stand as well. Congratulations, she brings 17, yes. 
she served Baltimore County for over 17 years prior to this appointment. She was the field representative in the Office of Transportation. She was also the routing assistant in the Office of Transportation and a school bus driver in the Office of Transportation. Congratulations, Cheryl A. Fulmill. Our next two candidates are watching virtually. We have E. Emery Davis as the new research specialist in the Office of Research. Welcome to Baltimore County Public Schools. Prior to this appointment, she was a postdoctorate uh, research fellow at Johns Hopkins University. She also served as a graduate student researcher, teaching assistant and course instructor at Johns Hopkins University in the Department of Cognitive Science. She also served as a marketing, marketing advisor, sales representative in, the, in humanities, social sciences, and language, as well as the market development coordinator in the psychology and education uh, unit of the McGraw-Hill Higher Education. So welcome to Baltimore County Public Schools. <laughs> and our last candidate is Charlene L. Tolbert as the new manager of leaves and employee absence in the Office of Employee Assistance and Risk Management. Welcome to Baltimore County Public Schools. Uh, prior to this appointment, she served as the Benefits Manager, Personnel Administrator 3, in the Maryland Department of Transportation. She also served as a Benefits Manager in the Maryland Institute College of Arts. She also served as a Senior Benefits Analyst, IKEA Human Resources Services, as well as an Administrative <coughs> Manager at, at IKEA. So congratulations, Charlene L. Tobert, and welcome to Baltimore County Public Schools. Our next item is public comment. This is one of the opportunities the board provides to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens. As appropriate, we will refer your concerns to the superintendent for follow-up by his staff. The Board of Education will conduct the public comment portion of the meeting by allowing those who register to speak to, att to attend in person. Registration was open to the public one week prior to tonight's board meeting and was closed at 3 p.m. yesterday for anyone wishing to speak at this evening's meeting. Board practice limits to 10 the number of speakers at a regularly scheduled board meeting. Speakers are selected randomly using an electronic selection process from all registrations received within the designated time frame. Each speaker is allowed three minutes to address the board. Of course, if fewer than 10 registrations are received, all who register will be permitted to speak. However, no speaker substitutions will be allowed. While we encourage public input on policy programs and practices within the purview of this board and this school system, this is not the proper forum to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. We encourage everyone to utilize existing dispute resolution processes as appropriate. I remind everyone that inappropriate personnel remarks or other behavior that disrupts or interferes with the conduct of this meeting are out of order. Persons using language that is threatening or promotes violence against a BCPS employee are subject to legal penalties. Persons who otherwise disrupt or disturb this meeting will not be allowed to continue their remarks and will be escorted from the meeting. I ask speakers to observe the three minute clock which lets you know when your time is up. Please conclude your remarks when you hear the tone or see that time has expired. The microphone will be turned off at the end of your time and it can be turned off if a speaker addresses specific student or employee matters or is commenting on matters not related to public education in Baltimore County. If not selected, the public may submit their comments to the board via email at boe at bcps.org. More information is provided on the board's website at bcps.org under Board of Education Participation by the Public. I will now call on our advisory and stakeholder group leaders to speak. Our first speaker is Marietta English from the NAACP Baltimore County Chapter. Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't know I was going to be first. Good evening, Chairman Lecter and Vice Chair 
Harvey, members of the board and Superintendent Williams. My name is Marietta English and I am chairperson for the NAACP Baltimore County branch and the new chair of the education committee and one of the spokespersons for the branch. When I signed up to speak, my plan was to share with you plans for AXO. You see, I'm wearing my shirt, and I thought I was going to have a student here to talk about AXO. However, after yesterday's announcement, I come with a different request. We, the Baltimore County branch of the NAACP, completely support the superintendency of Dr. Daryl Williams. He has been a partner and a supreme educator. When Dr. Williams became superintendent of the Baltimore County Public School Systems, little did he know what lied ahead of him. He faced a cyber attack which had never happened before, and he handled it. He faced a nationwide pandemic that no one was prepared for. No one knew how to teach virtually. Children needed computers. Teachers needed to teach a different way. This was all new. And Dr. Williams made sure that teachers and students had the equipment and tools they needed to work. Dr. Williams has have handled professionally other challenges that he's faced. He has always had an open door with us and has been open to suggestions. We have appreciated all that he has done. The Baltimore County branch of the NAACP, and we are not the Randallstown branch, and we do not agree with them. They only represent a small segment of the county. The Baltimore County branch requests that Dr. Williams reconsider and go for a new contract. It would be a loss to our students if he is not the superintendent. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jessica Paffenbarger from the GTCAC. Good evening, Chairwoman Lichter, board members, Dr. Williams and the BCPS community. My name is Jessica Paffenbarger, Vice Chair of the Citizens Advisory Committee for Gifted and Talented Education, a BCPS advisory group. The GTCAC is very concerned about the proposed staff decrease in the Office of Advanced Academics from four resource teachers, a director and an assistant, to only one resource teacher, a director and an assistant. This would follow the decrease from eight resource teachers to four in 2020. This shows a lack of academic support for both the education of approximately 30,000 GT twice exceptional and advanced learners who participate in advanced academic programs, as well as the school-based personnel who teach them. As you heard from our chair, Zamira Simpkins, and myself at the board public hearing on FY 2024 budget, the Office of Advanced Academics is where the specialized knowledge about how best to educate GT and other advanced level students resides. Let me reiterate that most colleges do not offer any courses to teachers and training regarding GT education. Assessing and identifying students, what constitutes appropriate curricula, and writing and presenting it to such students. OAA staff are experts in these areas, and their expertise is leveraged throughout the school system to help all staff in our 178 schools meet the educational needs of these students. Without advanced curricula, students may become bored, tune out, or get into mischief. Often test scores go down below ability level because students are not engaged and challenged. The OAA is your sole source of expertise for school-based personnel and families to call for support and to identify and write adequately differentiated GT and advanced curricula, which BCPS has, in particular, not provided with the new curricula, My View and Bridges in Math in Elementary English Language Arts and Mathematics and Illustrative Math in Middle School. 
from the Governor of Maryland to taxpaying families and businesses, the Code of Maryland regulations, and our policy and rules 6401. Everyone expects this school system to develop the talents of all our students. Our future logistics specialists, entrepreneurs, software developers, teachers, environmental scientists, and so on. If the curriculum does not appropriately prepare our highest achieving students, shame on us. Please make BCPS's vision statement, raising the bar, closing gaps, and preparing every student for the future, a reality for these students, and not just words on a website, by at least keeping the four resource teacher positions in the OAA, and we would ask adding one more for a total of five plus. Thank you. Our next speaker is Cindy Sexton from TAPCO. Good evening, Chair Lecter, Vice Chair Harvey, Dr. Williams, and members of the board. As you work through the budget, please let me remind you that it is your budget. Ultimately, you will be the ones who make the decisions around what is best. Best for our students, best for recruiting and retaining our educators, doing what will make a real and measurable difference in our school system. This budget does not provide a COLA for our staff. There is over 102 million in new county funding, but no COLA during historic inflation. For comparison, in Anne Arundel County, their superintendent is calling for step increases and a 6% COLA for all school employees. He offered that before their negotiations around wages even began. What a clear message to those educators that they are valued and their school system wants to retain them. Prince George's and Howard County educators got their steps into 4% COLA. Baltimore County, you must do better. We will continue to lose our educators to other counties with a budget that offers no COLA. Board members, it's up to you to fix this budget. We know the amount requested goes beyond the parameters given by the county executive. Please fix this budget and give the county council a, one that is defensible and sustainable one that prioritizes our educators and staff. Dr. Williams, we wish you the best in your future endeavors, but we still have work to do. We look forward to working with your team as we continue to address the ongoing payroll, HR benefit, and other concerns. Our educators deserve this to be taken care of and corrected quickly. We have more than five months still to go, and we need to get the work done. The work is hard and it doesn't stop. Let's make sure we finish strong because our students need and deserve it and so do our educators and staff. Board members, as you search for a superintendent, please include your stakeholders, especially our educators. 8,000 of us are the boots on the ground with our students and we know what they need and what we need to help them. As always, TABCO stands at the ready to be a part of this very important decision. Let's do the work together and let's get the work done. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Joe Coughlin from ESPBC. Thank you, Chair Lichter, Vice Chair Harvey, Superintendent Williams, and the other members of the school board for this opportunity to speak with you this evening. My name is Joe Coughlin, the Vice President of the Educational Support Professionals of Baltimore County. I'm coming to you today with mixed emotions. ESPBC is very appreciative of the opportunity this administration has afforded the support staff in Baltimore County Public Schools. We thank you for learn, learning about the integral nature of our paraeducators, technicians, office professionals, interpreters, and health assistants in supporting the staff of BCPS in the education of our students by including us on the planning and discussions of new initiatives. I am equally saddened to learn that Dr. Williams has decided to leave Baltimore County. He has been a champion for collaborative collaboration amongst all our stakeholders. He has supported us through the chaos of COVID with multiple memo, mem memos of understanding, navigated us through ransomware, need I say more, and countless statewide our system-wide initiatives. Thank you, um, thank you to you, Dr. Williams, and I wish you success in your future endeavors. Now looking for the future. 
We are hopeful that the board includes ESPBC as it begins looking for a new leader of the school system and we would and we will continue to be and hope that we will be a valued partner in that process. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is John Clark from AFSME. Good evening. Good evening, uh, Superintendent Dr. Williams and all the new and returning uh, members of the board. My name is uh, John H. Clark, proud school bus operator of Baltimore County Public Schools and uh, for the last 14 years and vice president of Ask Me Local 434. Here with permission on behalf of President Brian Epps where we represent all Ask Me workers who support the critical infrastructure of our school system. Our work helps to ensure that's, that the system lives up to its vision and goals, which we fully support. Uh, the dedicated workers I mentioned push, uh, push every day to raise the bar, close gaps, and prepare our students for a bright future. The first thing I'd like to address is the unexpected report I heard uh, while watching the news last night. Out of the reporter's mouth came the words, BCPS superintendent to step down at the end of the school year. Now, I'm not going to dwell on this subject, but uh, everyone knew that when Dr. Williams took on the responsibilities of becoming uh, the superintendent of BCPS, he was definitely walking into a firestorm. Events uh, and issues such as the pandemic, the cyber attack, uh, the operational and efficiency review report, uh, staffing shortages, and unruly behavior from a small sector of the student body all took a toll on the system itself. And I must say, your support system failed you, sir. As ASME's second in command, and on behalf of our, our entire membership, I, I would just like to say that, Dr. Williams, you have become a friend and an ally to, ally to ASME. And we appreciate all that you have done uh, within your power to further ASME's initiative to create a better workplace environment for all of our members. And we greatly thank you for being very instrumental in ASME at obtaining the largest pay increase in its history. We thank you for your service and wish you well in your future endeavors. And always remember, you had AFSCME's back, and we got yours. We still, we st you still have our support, sir. Uh, at the, uh, all that being said, uh, I spoke of, uh, of greatly appreciative, of being greatly appreciative of the pay increase that ASME uh, recently received. But it's still not enough. We ask for, uh, it's just not enough. It's not enough to get a qualified workforce in the door. It's not enough to attract decent talent from other areas of the state. It's not even enough to sustain the workforce already employed by BCPS. So much so that a large number of our existing employees have taken on second jobs just to sustain the households. It's just not enough. BCPS uh, pay scales have not kept up with the rate of inflation for many years. The stories I constantly hear from my members and fellow co co-workers is that they're caught up between a rock and a hard place. <laughs> Thank you. Next is general public comment, and our first speaker is Bash Farone. Good evening to all. Welcome Good back. Good evening. Um, I really truly enjoyed your discussion last meeting about public speakers. Um, to me, the most important about addressing public speakers is really that you display that you really truly care about public speaking. As you know, most of the 20 stakeholders don't really come, except for the bargaining units, as you've seen. So as far as increasing the number to 15, my suggestion is 
that you address the problem of those who do not really show up rather than increase the number from 10 to 15. In the last meeting, I mentioned to you the word Northeast. And I really didn't mean Northeast as Northeast. I meant that you, the Board of Education, uh, need to consider to address the issue of stakeholders not really showing up, um, except very few of them. Personally, I don't think really dragging the feet is a good policy. And it does conflict with policy 8315 and 1230. In the five education advisory councils, there are about 50 members minus plus. And as you see, you know, very few of them show up. So my thought to you, suggestion, when you change the policy, if a chair or coordinator don't show up three times in a row, then that's not really a stakeholder. Yeah, these people are supposed to do the work and come and report to you. A stakeholder means you put a stake, you come here. So three times and something needs to be done. Same thing with the coordinator. If the coordinator doesn't show up three times in a row, that's not coordination. So what do I suggest about public speaking? I think 10 is a reasonable number. I ask you for four minutes instead of three, especially for people like self. I can't really talk fast. And I really ask you not to cut off speakers. It just doesn't look good. I, I mean, you know, you can say as a chair, you know, please wrap it up. Ten extra seconds is not really a big deal. So thank you very much. Thank you. The next speaker is Amy Adams. Good evening. Good evening, Chair Lichter, Vice Chair Harvey, Dr. Williams, and members of the board. I would like to start this meeting, uh, my comment by thanking the people who took the time to read the budget last week and attend the session for public comment. I thought many of them brought up very interesting points. I agree with the concerns regarding the funding of the GT programs and positions. I agree with the concerns about the top heavy administration, especially if we're significantly stacked in the central office over the two larger LEAs in the state. I have concerns about and questions about the additional 36 FTE secondary ESOL positions that they might not be enough to fill the need of the students in our system, particularly if ESOL centers are closing or students are giving the option to return to their home zoned schools. I believe we have 30 middle schools and 26 high schools, so I'm looking for more details to show how this increase would be adequate, adequate to um, accommodate the needs. I'm also interested in how we're asking for a 9.5 increase in the budget when our enrollment fell during the pandemic years and just hasn't rebounded as we have predicted. What is the status of the ELA pilot and the requested $10 million for the ELA curriculum? And thank you again to the board members for revising the public attendance and public comment at open meetings. As a member of a group who frequently registers and attends meetings, I'd like to combine option B and E. No registration for attendance, online speaker registration a week prior, 10 speakers, three minutes, option to join virtually or by phone, um, through the online registration form and perhaps require a confirmation to, any, to open up any available and unused spots. And then there could be a wait list for people who s show up and would like to give comment. I'm concerned that the academic report is not on a, the agenda tonight, especially on the day that the spring 2022 app math and ELA scores were released for the districts. For those of us in BCPS community, safety and academics are always our priority. Thank you for the time tonight, and I look forward to the budget discussion and the public comment discussion. Thank you. Our next speaker is Nikita Scott. Good evening, former board chair. Do 
you hear me okay? Great. Thank you all so much. Um, good evening and hello. Thank you, Madam Chair Littner, Vice Chair Harvey, Superintendent Dr. Williams, and I would like to acknowledge Dr. Brenda Savoy from the 4th District and appointed board member Ms. Molly Joes. I would like to thank you all for your commitment and your service to children. I would like to speak today about the importance of ensuring that all of our children have the opportunity to experience a well-rounded and deeply fulfilling education. Our children deserve the very best, and it is all of our jobs to ensure that they are provided with all the necessary tools required so that they may succeed in school. Diversity in history has been and is currently under attack, most recently the book banning in many school districts across the nation. I would like to implore this board to protect the ability of Baltimore County school children to learn accurate history that is reflective of our community's population, of students, and parents. The national history of this country does not belong to one race or group of people, but it is the history of us all. It is American history. Diverse learning opportunities benefit all children and should be the bedrock from which we all spring. As a former chair of the Equity Committee, I deeply understand the impact of inequality and the effect it has on children. So please continue to debate and rigorously provide our children with the most diverse curriculum so that our scholars graduate seeing themselves in literature or learning more about another culture. And to leave you with this, as you all debate on the budget tonight, I would like to quote a uh, former board member and good friend, Roger Hayden. He used to say, the kids are the bottom line. So thank you for that, and we are truly stronger together. And it's wonderful to see all of you again. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sharon Serhoff. Good evening. I first would like to say that I have mixed feelings about Dr. Williams leaving, and that is truth. Um, while he and I have not seen eye to eye, and to be quite honest, I am not sorry to see you go. Um, I do wish you luck, and I do feel that you have made somewhat of an attempt to make the school, si school system better. On that note, the reason that I am saying what I'm saying tonight is because the concerns that I want to bring to your attention are concerns that I've had for the past four years. The number one concern that I've had is leadership. We can't tell schools to do what they want we can't trust schools, administrators, to know their students best. They don't always know that. I currently have students within this county that the administrators are literally making decisions for parents and saying, your child's ready to graduate when parent doesn't agree your child doesn't need special education services, that's a team decision, not an administrator's decision. You need to provide guidelines and you need to provide, hold your schools accountable. And there is no accountability currently in a lot of the schools in this county. A lack of accountability causes irreparable damage to students. When they graduate, we don't have control over them, but we've done the damage. And that's one of the reasons that I am here tonight. Before you go, Dr. Williams, fix the budget. Don't cut the GT program down to the bare bottom. Fix special education return the things that I have mentioned previously. Teach your schools to collaborate with parents and communicate with stakeholders. Teach people to be accountable and to be willing 
to address concerns about safety and not dismiss them. Leave the school system better than when it wa that what it was when you came in. Thank you, and I do wish you luck. Thank you. Our next speaker is Teresa Asbury. Our next speaker is Jesse Yeager. Good evening. Good evening. Hello, my name is Jesse Yeager. I'm a parent of Hampton Elementary students. I also have the privilege of working as a paraeducator at Hampton. First of all, Dr. Williams, thank you for your service and your efforts on behalf of Baltimore County. I do wish you the very best. Now to the rest of the board, you will now begin your process of seeking a new superintendent, but Hampton Elementary cannot wait for a new superintendent to solve our overcrowding problem. We need an emergency boundary study now to go into effect for the 2023-2024 school year. I am deeply concerned with the lack of transparency in contracting with Cropper GIS Consulting for the boundary study that put Hampton in this position. There was no RFP for the Pleasant Plains study. There was no RFP for this current Central and Northeast Middle School boundary study. The 2020 boundary study led by Cropper GIS promised to bring only 100 students to Hampton. Instead, our student population has grown by more than 300, a 51% increase in just three years. We brought up the flawed projections then, and I am concerned that they are utilizing flawed projections again for present studies. Based on the BCPS data dashboard, Hampton is never projected to surpass 110% capacity in 10 years. We have reached 121% in less than three years. In addition to projections being gross underestimates of reality, using only September 30th numbers is erroneous. Our September 30th projection for this year was 731. Our actual September 30th enrollment was 773. And now we hover around 810. We have simply run out of room. This is a school that has lived through 10 trailers, a redistricting, a renovation and addition, and another redistricting. To add more trailers when other schools are available would be fiscally irresponsible. We are now operating at 121% capacity, far beyond the county's own standards. This is severely undermining our learning experience, and if we don't receive immediate action, it will only get worse. I am, a calling, I am calling upon you to recognize that Hampton's experience is part of a systemic problem of overcrowding that is afflicting schools throughout the whole county. This is an urgent issue that must be front and center as you conduct your search for the next superintendent and review contracts with consultants. For me, I recognize the county issue, but Hampton's problem feels extreme and immediate, and I implore you to order an emergency boundary study to be completed before the next school year. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Amber Holt. Our next speaker is Lloyd Allen. Good evening, Chair Lichter, Vice Chair Harvey, Superintendent Williams, and members of the board. Thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. I'm Lloyd Allen, Special Educator in Mathematics, speaking as an individual. First, Dr. Williams, thank you for your service. I have appreciated your skill with interpreting and presenting statistics through all phases of the last three years. Second, last week my remarks included the line, please tell me that I am wrong. In fact, I was wrong. I understand that the $22.8 million budget line for substitute salaries is a more transparent way, thank you, of reflecting that substitute salaries that moved from instructional salaries and wages to other instructional costs roughly aligned with the expense for sub salaries in previous years. The $2 million contract for the vendor was a new expense with the FY23 budget and is maintained at that same level 
of 2 million for FY24. Whew. Ratios. Now, I do maintain that 29 to 1 is larger than optimal for effective instruction. It is also important to note that if we are striving for the ratio of 29 students to one teacher, there will invariably be some classes that are larger and some that are smaller. I have taught classes of 32, but things get dicey when there isn't enough room in the classroom to have a desk for each student, and purposeful movement, individual feedback, and strategies that encourage thinking routines, stations, gallery walks, even simply having students write problems on the board are all difficult to implement with crowded classes. Eggs and cola. Everyone's talking about eggs right now. At the farmer's market, 30 eggs run $10. A dozen or $5 or $6. You might note that these egg cartons are empty and wonder why. You see, I understand that there is no cola in the budget. A cost of living allowance is used to adjust compensation. The rate that educators earn over the summer when their talents are used to write and refine curriculum, the entries in the salary tables, notably the entries for folks who have stepped out and reached the end of the pay scale, if there is no COLA, then they earn less next year than they earned this year. To some degree, we need to compete with our neighboring jurisdictions. To a greater degree, we need to compete with jurisdictions that export teachers rather than import them like we do. We don't need to outrun the bear that is the national teacher shortage, but we do need to outrun enough systems to be at full staffing. This means moving towards exceeding the starting salary of 60,000 for beginning educators that is mandated by the Kerwin framework that is now law so that we outrun our neighbors. We also need to support the Maryland Education Support Professional Bill of Rights and ensure that all of our employees, all, are earning an adequate living wage no 1.0 employee for BCPS should need a second job to support their family. With the price of eggs, I'm quite surprised at the absence of a cola. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Janelle Wallstrom. Good evening. Good evening, I'm Janelle Wallstrom and I am a parent of two children at Hampton Elementary. And I am here again speaking on behalf of teachers, staff, current parents and prospective parents to request an emergency boundary study happen at Hampton Elementary. As of today, we have 811 students. Uh, we have a state rated capacity of 670 students and we are at 121% capacity. In 2020, there was the boundary study that we were a part of and ultimately we helped assist us assist a school who was in the same position that we are now. We welcomed those students and they are a wonderful part of our Hampton community. But now here we are in 2023 and we are struggling with severely overcrowded classrooms and we need you to step in. We have 811 students for one nurse to care for in a time where illness is high. We have one principal and one vice principal to manage, care for, and help implement proper learning strategies for all of our 811 students, while also assisting teachers with their overcrowded classrooms. We have one guidance counselor to help the social and emotional well-being of our students. We are now back in person after the virtual learning that occurred with the pandemic and many children are struggling to adjust. This is across the county and the country, not just here. Many are dealing with anxiety and the inability to emotionally regulate. Many are having trouble making the social connections that they lost from having to social distance for so long, which was necessary and important for the health and safety of everyone, but has lasting effects. And Hampton has one guidance counselor to help all of the 811 of our children. Hampton has a wonderful and capable staff and administration who can only do so much, and they do a lot. But what just simply can't be done then rests on the shoulders of our teachers, and they have to carry an impossible load. These amazing teachers are in the classrooms that are past the limit prescribed per Maryland code for teacher to student ratios. All of our kindergarten classes have 25 to 27 students when they should have 22. 
I hope that you can see this picture that I have tried so hard to paint for you to show you the severity of our overcrowded school. Hampton is filled with amazing teachers, fantastic staff and administrators who are doing everything they possibly can with an incredibly difficult situation. I leave you with this. What does 2023, 2024 look like for Hampton Elementary? 900 students, classes filled with 30 students. We need your help please grant us this emergency boundary study. Thank you. Our last speaker is Heather Mullen. That concludes our public, general public comment section of the meeting. The next item on the agenda is action taken in closed session, and for that I call Mr. Brusades. Good morning, Chair Lichter. Good morning. Or good evening. <laughs> uh, nothing to report from closed session. Okay. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is consideration of FY 2024 county capital budget request. And for that, I call Mr. Hartlove and Mr. Dixit. Good evening, uh, Chair Lichter, Vice Chair Harvey. Dr. Williams and members of the board. On December 20th, 2022, we introduced the FY 2024 County Capital Plan to you at the work session on January 13th, 2023. We answered all the qu questions that were sent to us. Finally, today we are here to ask for your approval of the 2024 capital County Capital Plan. Yes, Ms. Hen. Thank you, I have a motion, may I? Yes. Thank you, um, thank you. Whereas on January 17th, 2023, the County Council enacted Resolution 1-23, requesting that Baltimore County Public Schools begin the review of the suitability of property known as the Lafarge Quarry as a school site, and whereas the superintendent has communicated that BCPS intends to comply with the county council's request and will begin a site study as outlined in resolution 1-23, it is therefore moved that the FY 2024 county capital budget request be amended on line seven by deleting the words Lock Raven from the Northeast Area High project description and replacing the C indicating central under area with TBD indicating to be determined. May I have a second to Ms. Hen's motion? Second, Pumphrey. Is there any discussion? Ms. Hen, would you like to discuss your motion? We discussed it at length at the last meeting, so I'll reserve my time in case there are any questions. Okay, Ms. Joes. Thank you. So the county has already made a resolution. Um, my issue is that Dr. Williams has already stated that we will go forward with doing the study as required by scratching out a $1.2 million study that was the MAI pass recommendation. We're kicking the can down the road if that site is to be found unsuitable. Furthermore, the resolution asks for a vocational school and it's not gonna help alleviate the problem that we have in the central and northeast area. Um, Lock Raven, to my understanding, does have space and the real reasoning is probably that Lock Raven Academy is predominantly an African American school and perhaps people don't want to send their children there. That is the segregation that happens in Baltimore County Public Schools. I live in this area for the past 20 years. Uh, my children attend the Northeast Area Elementary Schools and high schools. So um, I, while I support the motion, I don't support the scratching out or uh, striking out from the capital budget, so I will not be supporting the motion. Thank you, Ms. Hen. Thank you. Um, the resolution that the county enacted was modified and a revised copy was provided to the full board. Vocational was removed from the resolution and Lock Raven Academy is the middle school. This is involving the high school. Thank you. Other discussion? Ms. Joes? Yeah, I meant Lock Raven High School was what I meant, I misspoke. Um, I will not be supporting the motion while I support the resolution that the county passed. I don't support scratch um, the motion. I would like to amend it to remove um, the, well, actually, do you have the motion written? 
You wanted to restate the motion? Yeah, if she could. Sure. Um, whereas on January 17th, 2023, the County Council enacted Resolution 1 23, requesting that Baltimore County Public Schools begin the review of the suitability of property known as the Lafarge Quarry as a school site. And whereas the superintendent has communicated that BCPS intends to comply with the County Council's request and will begin a site study as outlined in Resolution 1 23, it is therefore moved that the fiscal year 2024 County Capital Budget request be amended on line seven by deleting the words Lock Raven from the Northeast Area High project description and replacing the C indicating central under area with TBD indicating to be determined. And may I speak to the motion? Yes. Director? Thank you. Um, what this does is leaves open the possibility of determining the site by removing the um, finality of determining that the site will be Lock Raven High. So it leaves it open to the possibility of the Lafarge Quarry as a site. It does not lock in any one particular site because um, Superintendent Williams has agreed to comply with the request to study the Lafarge Quarry as a potential site. So it simply removes the designation of Lock Raven as the final site. Thank you. Ms. Chose? Yes. I would like to amend to strike. It is therefore removed to, to, be, de to be determined. OK. So any, so now we're talking about Ms. Joe's amendment, which is to strike the words. And um, board members, it's in the chat. Uh, Ms. Hen's motion is in the chat. Ms. Joe's just added, or not added, would like the words, the last three words, to be determined. TBD indicating to be determined to be deleted. Correct, Ms. Joe's? From her motion, yes. OK. Um, Ms. Hen? Um, a comment and a clarifying question. Um, TBD replaces the C under central because the Lafarge Quarry is located in the northeast area. So rather than indicate a any e or leaving it a C, both of which would be inaccurate, TBD indicates that it has not yet be, been determined. I would support this amendment if it leaves that entry blank. However, leaving it as C is inaccurate because this particular site is in the Northeast, as it is a Northeast high school study. So I would ask Ms. Joes if her intent in amending this motion is to leave it blank or if it is to leave it as C for Central. Ms. Joes? Oh, sorry. My amendment is to strike from it is therefore moved that the FY24 budget request be amended by deleting the words Lock Raven from the Northeast Area Project description until the words to be determined. So striking out that entire move. So, Ms. Joes, it is therefore moved. So you're looking at the last paragraph in her motion, correct? Right. It is therefore moved that the FY 2024 County Capital Budget Request be amended on line seven by, do I keep going? Deleting the words Lock Raven from the Northwest Area High project description and replacing C, indicating central period. Yeah, I think Ms. Howie has a comment, probably procedural, so. Uh, Ms. Howie? Yes, board members, I was just typing in the chat. There was no second to the motion, as Ms. Pumphrey pointed out, but you've already begun discussion of the motion, so that's considered to be a second. So we don't need a second. We've, we do need a second. Is there a second on Ms. Joe's motion? Point of clarification, I think Ms. Howie just said we don't need a second. That's what I thought. The, the discussion is a de facto second. Okay, so we don't need the second. Okay, and Hassan. Okay, Ms. Hassan. I'm I just, I just had a question just to clarify. So this resolution that um, Ms. Hen put forth, is it the same one as the one that we discussed last board meeting to parallel with the county resolution? I just wanted a little clarification on that. Director, may I respond? Yes. Thank you. It is um, not. There were two um, motions in my original, um, there are two actions in my original motion. 
The first was to make the same amendment to the capital request. The second was to ask Superintendent Williams to um, conduct the study. He has since um, sent a letter, the board received a letter just before closed session today, indicating that um, he has agreed to comply with the county council's request and to conduct the study. So that part of the motion has been removed. Um, the other word change, there were two slight word changes. One removes vocational because the county council modified their resolution, striking vocational or adding the possibility of a general school site. The second was um, that they've enacted it, whereas previously, um, they had not enacted it yet. Um, so just to clarify, sorry again, um, this would just change the wording within the co county capital budget request to delete lock, to delete Lock Raven and then put TBD for Central, just indicating that we haven't yet made a concrete decision. And then I guess this would be a question for the team. So what implications would that hold on anything that we've currently discussed regarding Lock Raven as the Northeast Area High project that we've been discussing. So I just want to remind the board that this study was done to create additional seats in the Northeast area of the county. Uh, while we distinguish these areas with Northeast and Central, when we apply for state funding, all of the adjoining schools in that area are considered for enrollment projections and because of the state process, uh, an existing school will, will include their enrollment plus additional seats. A new school at any site will consider only additional seats uh, from the state perspective. And as I indicated in the last meeting, that may create a difference of 30 to $40 million for county to carry. That remains still good, whether it's C, nothing, or Northeast, because in the end, we have to apply for state participation. So I just wanted to share that information. So, sorry, last question. Um, if So if we do change it, and you know, change it to that TBD, um, so with that turnaround time, then for us to evaluate the Lafarge property, would that part like would that possibly backfire if we leave it as TBD and then submit it to the state like for state consideration? If we haven't like fully put Lock Raven as a placeholder or a specific name, I just, I'm just wondering if the timing so can possibly it backfire. So delay the process for starting pre-planning for that school because as part of the process, uh, eventually we have to request state to approve for the planning. And we cannot do it unless we share a site with the state for a school. Okay, thank you. Ms. Mumphrey? Ms. Domanowski? <laughs> um, I just, I don't know if this is a question for uh, Ms. Hen or for, for you guys, but um, can you clarify that the Northeast Central um, surveying doesn't have, is it, is it to alleviate Lock Raven or replace the Lock Raven High School, or is it something completely separate? So the additional seats needed for the Northeast area is approximately 300 to 400 seats. By replacing a school like Lock Raven, you get state funding for the existing seats that the school has, plus the additional seats that will be providing. If we build a school on a new site, the only justification we have for state funding is for the additional seats, which is 300 seats. So if we build a school for 1,500 seats, about 1,200 of those seats will not be eligible for state funding. Okay, but correct, but Lock Raven is in Central, and this is for a Northeast alleviation, correct? So when we justify to state, all of the current boundaries for schools are considered. So anything that is uh, considered right now for Northeast, some of it is in the central area, that'll be considered for that. So we define as the planning regions, a state goes by the boundaries uh, of the existing schools that are in that area, regardless of whether they are in central area or northeast area. 
respond as well. Ms. Wait, Wait, Ms. Mumphrey. Just a quick question. Do you have, you mentioned applying for state funding. Um, do you have a specific date in mind for that? Because you are saying in the future, is there a specific date that you anticipate applying for the state funding? So the purpose of this study was to find a way of, for 300 additional seats. If we do not build the capacity, what that means is that in future, that number will keep increasing and we'll have to put kids in some other relocatable or other, other strategies. And, and, the, and the community input we received, they do not support additions in existing high school. They support new school. I understand, but my question was, is there a specific date from when you have to apply for the state funding? Do we need we to have applied. that information by a certain date? So before we applied to state for construction funding, we have to do planning work. And that planning work needs to start as soon as we can for the Northeast area and for the Southeast area. These two areas were um, indicated in the My IPASS study to be the highest need area. So I so, guess my question should be rephrased, is there a date to start the planning period? If we weren't to consider this at all, would, there, would you already have a date um, by which you would start, you, you intend on starting the planning period? So the first part for the planning is to share with the state where we are going to build the school. And that's the p part of the reason we had the site uh, uh, request at this point. So we cannot even start pre-planning unless we find where's, where, where's the site. Thank you. Mr. McMillian. Uh, Mr. Dixon, how much did the Northeast area overcrowding analysis end up costing us? $500,000 was budgeted. What did it cost? We shared that number in a response to you. Okay. It was in the neighborhood of 100,000 or 100. We shared that number with you. Okay, but I, was, all the I wanted members. the public to hear that. Yeah. So uh, do you remember the number? Yes, well, about around $130,000. $130,000. Yeah, yeah. And you stated at the last meeting that Lafarge was not an option that they looked at, correct? No, Lafarge was not an option that they looked at. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Ms. Dr. Hager? Um, yes, thank you. Um, I, I guess I'm, I'm a little bit confused about why we got the letters saying that we were going to consider the Lafarge property, if it sounds like we we can't really consider it, I, I guess I don't I don't understand what, what step that why we took that step. I don't know if Dr. Williams could answer that. Because we respected county's resolution that was enacted. But we have no intention of actually considering it for this school. Now we do because we have a county resolution. So um, the county council. Again, great partners, and they provided an opportunity for us to explore um, this uh, piece of land, the Lafarge Quarry. And so my letter was acknowledging that there were resolutions, discussions at the county council level, and they put forth, kind of um, lessened the restriction the first time. There were discussions about a, a type of school and we had a brief discussion as board members. They lessened that, thank you, for us to explore what that piece of land could be used for. And there were several options. And so we wanted to acknowledge our funders, thank you. Um, and that's what the letter said. We will explore what kind of options we can um, hopefully build there. Um, and that's the work that we put forth that we will do an assessment to figure out what that may be. So what, what Mr. Dixon and team members are saying, we don't know if that space will actually address the overcrowding that's happening on that side without looking at other schools in that area. So Dr. Hager, it was, the letter was, was, a, was simply saying, thank you, County Council. We've heard you, we appreciate this. Let us now kind of explore what options we could kind of build on that land. Thank you. Let me just see, um, Merrill and Pete, any additional information you want to add? No, you have provided good information because there may be need for other type of schools in future uh, that we don't see at this point. 
but uh, my conversation is mainly focused on the high school. So I just want to make sure I understand. When you said that we're looking for 300 seats, and then the stay would support the 300 seats, but for Lock Raven, they'll support the new school and the 300 seats? They will count existing seats that are in Lock Raven because we are replacing Lock Raven. So what you'll have the existing uh, SRC of Lock Raven plus the additional that seats that are needed in that area. So let's assume it's 1,000 seats in Lock Raven right now. And then if we provide additional 300 to 400 seats, so we'll get funded for 1,400 seats. And the idea about Central versus Northeast, what you're saying is any adjacent high school boundaries to Lock Raven would be involved in a boundary study. So that's why you're not emphasizing the Central versus Northeast. It's anybody adjacent to the Lock Raven would be part of the boundary process to do the shifting to right size capacity at those schools. That's right. Okay, so it's not necessarily people driving from all the way in the heart of White Marsh to Lock Raven. It might be moving multiple kids from different schools to sh right size it. And that will be decided by community boundary, during right. the redistricting process. Okay, thank you. Other? Um, <laughs> okay, Ms. Joes. Thank you. So I just want to clarify that boundaries are man-made. Lock Raven High School is in Central District, but it's further away from Hereford High School, which is also in Central District. It is closer to Towson, which is severely overcrowded. When we alleviate that overcrowding in Lock Raven, it's going to help Northeast and Central. And those boundaries will be re, um, there'll be a restudy of those boundaries as we do. It's helping two districts with taking away the central northeast part, it's actually part of alleviating problems in the central and northeast area. While nobody is saying that we're not going to look at the Lafarge site, we will certainly are going to look at it for the resolution. It's going to help build that additional 300, but it's not going to help Towson. It's not going to help Lock Raven. And correct me, Mr. Dixit, is Lock Raven High School overcrowded? I don't think so. I don't think so. I don't okay. have the number, but I don't think so. All right, thank you. So we're still on Ms. Joe's amendment to the motion, correct? Yes. yes. So, um, Mr. Kuhn, you haven't had a chance to speak, so I'll let you have our final word. Thank you. I just have a quick comment. I just I want to be crystal clear. Um, the letter that was sent is saying we will look at it, and what we're all saying tonight is it has nothing to do with the Northeast High School study. That's exactly what's been shared here. So I just want clarification. We have no intention whatsoever of using Lafarge as a site to build a high school on to handle overcrowding in the Northeast area. Well, that's going to be decided by the board and our funding partners. So uh, one of the funding partner is county and county council is part of the county. So they have enacted a resolution to look at the site. Okay, and I'll clarify a little further. That. Uh, because I'm, I'm looking at the request, and we're requesting five t total $10 million in county funding to you know do the planning for the Lock Raven site. That's going in the next request. So if we're requesting to draw plans and set things in motion to build a new Lock Raven, please don't tell me at the same time that we're actually gonna consider building a high school at Lafarge. It just doesn't make sense. It's kind of out of order timing-wise. That's why if we removed the words Lock Raven and Central, it would still be a possibility, and we could still go back to Lock Raven if that's what, where we end up with. So construction funds have not been approved so uh, even before we finally decide on the site, we'll be coming to board for site's approval. And you, what you are seeing is, is a request for uh, a high school to replace Lock Raven High School and a larger capacity in that school to meet the seat needs. And, and what needs to be emphasized here, that seats are needed. And if we do not have seats, just like you hear about Hampton right now, the next board or in future, 
you'll be hearing about kids uh, in relocatables and 400 kids, 300 right, I'm, kids. Right, I'm fully aware of relocatables. So that needs to be emphasized at the same time. Yeah. Uh, uh, just to, to, to finish, um, we're specifically talking about the FY24 county capital budget request, which includes $5 million in planning for, on item 11, number seven, a Lock Raven replacement school. So that does not, if, if, we're, if we're dedicating the funds, I guess is my question, because right here it sounds to me like we're dedicating $5 million for Lock Raven replacement high school. At the same time, we're saying we'll look at Lafarge at maybe some other possible use in the future, but we're not gonna even consider it for a high school to meet the needs of the Northeast at this point. So, so Mr. Kuhn, you, just for everyone to understand, <clears throat> we presented this capital budget proposal and Lafarge wasn't even a discussion. All right. You remember that? Good. Because the, the folks that looked at the spaces and the feedback from the community, everyone agrees, we are not trying to build mega high schools. We, community that was not in favor of any additions. So they explore other clusters to see, is there another option? Lock Raven was presented before the Lafarge, or maybe it was the same time, Miss Hen, because I think you brought, it, brought that to our attention. Then there was some more discussion. So at this point, we don't know what we can actually build on the Lafarge property. It hasn't been studied. So this is the only thing the team is saying. We are, we're grateful that we have a potential property. We got to study to see what possibilities we can build there. But this was here prior to the council making an amendment to their resolution. So the team has not done its work to see what could potentially build there. So there's a motion, an amended motion about the property but the team, just for the board to understand, we don't know exactly what size of a school building we can build there. So, so the team is just presenting this information and now we have this wonderful opportunity of exploring some property. So you're right, everything you see here is adding up and the, the recommendation was looking at Lock Raven. The board wants to do something completely different Great, now we have another option to explore, but I must emphasize if the team hasn't done its work, we can't come back to you and say, it's big enough for high school, big enough for middle school, big enough for elementary. Um, and, and it's my understanding, the community has to weigh in as well. So there's a lot of work around this. So that's just where we are. There's a motion on the floor and um, I don't know how much more right. discussion we so need to have. So Ms. Jones, can you restate your motion? Or you're the amendment to the motion. I move to strike the words, it is therefore moved that the FY24 capital budget request be amended on line seven by deleting the words Lock Raven from the Northeast Area High project description and replacing the C, including central area under area with TBD indicating to be determined. Chair Lichter, okay. can we get legal advice? That seems like an illegal motion. It cancels the entire motion. Mr. Mercedes? That is the motion. It, it does seem to be just a, a, a straight uh, no vote on the motion. No. Uh, and it seems to be more of an independent motion than an amendment to the motion. It, 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 in, it in essence nullifies the motion. So at, at this time, we need to vote on that motion, correct? On Ms. Or, but you're saying it's not a legal motion. Allowed, so is no. it not allowed? Is the it's motion not. not allowed or it's just nullifying the? Allowed. I could. Yeah, I don't, I don't think that it's not allowed, right. but I just want the board to members know. to be clear as to what they're voting on, what the amended motion does. The amended motion essentially nullifies the motion. So voting yes on the amendment would be tantamount to voting no on the 
Ms. Hen's motion. Then point of order, I would ask that you consider not allowing that motion as it is out of order for a properly constructed motion as it nullifies my motion. But then we could vote no on that motion, which would take instead of nullifying the motion. So I'd like a roll call on Ms. Joe's motion. Could you clarify Ms. what the amendment to the motion? Could you please clarify then how we vote because it's extremely out of practice. It's making so then. Ms. Gover, can you do a roll call vote on the amendment to the motion? Ms. Tomanowski? No. Ms. Pumphrey? No. Mr. McMillian? No. Ms. Hen? No. Ms. Jose? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Dr. Hager? No. Mr. Kuhn? No. Ms. Lichter? No. Favor is four. So that motion doesn't pass. So we're now back to Ms. Hen's motion, which is written, which is typed on the chat, correct? Correct. Okay. So I'm not going to read that whole motion. Everybody sees it on the chat. So now we need a roll call vote on Ms. Hen's motion. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Jose? No. Ms. Harvey? No. Mr. Offerman? No. Dr. Savoy? No. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Lichter? No. Favor is six. So the motion passes. Passes. Okay, let me get back to my other script. Okay, so we are motion to, is there any more discussion before we do the discussion? So do I have a motion to approve the FY 2024 County Capital Budget Request as presented in Exhibit H1? So moved. Pardon, so moved pardon, pardon me, me, Chair Lichter? Yes. Um, your script needs to be modified okay. to read as amended since we amended it. Okay. Do I have a motion to approve the FY 2024 County Capital Budget Request as presented in Exhibit HY, including the amendment? Thank you. So moved, Offerman. May I have a second? Second, Hen. Is there any further discussion? May I have a roll call vote, Ms. Gover? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. Motion passes. Whew. Thank you. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is the work session on the superintendent's proposed FY 2024 operating budget. And for that, I call on Dr. Williams and Mr. Hartlove. Good evening, Chair Lichter. Vice Chair Harvey. Um, tonight we uh, take our, I guess our third step in the FY24 operating budget. We started off with Dr. Williams' presentation of the budget at our last uh, board meeting, and then um, we had a hearing last week. Next slide, please. Go forward one more, please. Okay, so we'll just start off. Um, I'll start off by saying I'm going to be brief because you want to dive into the folks who are going to get into the details of the budget. I'm going to give an overview. A little bit of this is things that have already happened. We had the hearing uh, last week with some good participation. Um, tonight we're having our, our work session, and I will say um, we'll try to get through everything tonight, but if we don't, we, we can add another work session at a future uh, board meeting. And then um, a little over a month from now, uh, the board 
uh, you will uh, adopt your operating budget uh, February 28th at uh, that board meeting. Uh, next slide, please. So we're going to dig into um, as many of these areas as we can tonight, curriculum and instruction, uh, schools, expansion, transportation, facilities, information technology, human resources. Uh, we're also actually, as we go through each one of those areas, we're going to talk about the one-time items. Next slide, please. So just the highlights of the budget. Um, this, you've heard over the last several years, uh, much talk about the blueprint for Maryland's future implementation. It actually officially is beginning this year. There have been, there have been some uh, bridges, uh, some funding coming in, but this is actually, we're on the formula now officially. So it's starting uh, this year. Um, there's a lot of discussion about exactly what is, is requested in the superintendent's uh, budget as far as revenue. Um, to be clear, we are requesting um, $36.4 million in additional ongoing revenue, and that equates to a 3.96% increase from last year over the county. Um, and we have looked at the last 10 years of actuals, and it, it's, it, it's in uh, alignment with, uh, with those requests. Some years we've uh, gotten a little bit more, some years we've gotten a little bit less, but it's in alignment with that. Um, some, just some real quick highlights of what's included. Uh, first of all, $24.9 million in cost reductions to help fund the FY23 compensation enhancements. As you're aware, we, uh, we did negotiate some enhancements that were uh, favorable uh, salary enhancements uh, last year. Uh, only partial funding was in the, in the on, ongoing funding. We paid for the rest of it in the current year with one-time funding. This budget now uh, builds that into the base on, in an ongoing manner. Um, for the upcoming year, it also uh, begins uh, the, the, comp the conversation and funds a compensation step increase for all eligible employees for FY24. It also realizes that negotiations are not necessarily, you know, they happen separate from, from, uh, from this process. So we have a placeholder in the budget for ongoing negotiations with um, associations. Um, and uh, it would be offset by additional budgetary efficiencies. Um, an important point in, in the budget is, is that it includes a $7 million increase as requested by the county when we, when we <coughs> met with them back in the fall when we were talking about our plan to pay for the raises. They also said they would like us to increase our OPEB contribution. And we also, as every as, as, as that we are as individuals, we're dealing with inflation as an organization and the, uh, and the budget in, includes uh, inflationary increases of over $20 million. Next slide, please. Um, just to uh, just to show that we've met the uh, the kind of agreement that we had with the county, uh, we we uh, discussed 16 million dollars. We were able to exceed that, and I, we identified uh, 24.9 million dollars as as detailed here. Uh, we are aligning our teacher allocation to our current enrollment. We've uh, we're proposing to reduce central office resource teachers, uh, reduce our cell phone stipends mi and mileage allowances, and utilize uh, salary turnover um, savings uh, due to retirements uh, uh, for a, a total of uh, twenty four point nine million dollars. Uh, next slide, please. And now you're done with the boring part, and you're going to get to the exciting part. I'm going to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Boswell McComas and her staff. And uh, we will leave space for you. Uh, let me chase you away. Yes. Do we have one more chair? Mr. Tanliff, why don't you have a seat at the table and the staff can come up. The table behind. Yes. Oh, I'm good. I can take it. <laughs> and I'm going to have six chairs. Thank you. I know Melissa's going to need to speak to Blueprint, too. Hi. <laughs> Do you have a senior this year? Congratulations. <laughs> oh, congratulations. That's good. Do you have one that already graduated? Okay. 
Okay, thank you everyone for giving us a moment to have um, our key people at the table to be prepared to answer any of your questions. Um, is the slide going back up, Ms. Gober? There we go, thank you. Um, so let me just take a moment to in introduce everyone. So as you know, I'm Dr. Mary McComas. I have the pleasure of serving as our Chief Academic Officer. Mm -hmm. I'm joined this evening by key members of my team that are relevant to this evening's discussion. Um, I have Ms. Megan Shea is our Executive Director of Teaching and Learning. They're all the traditional content area offices, uh, such as math and ELA and CTE and ESOL. Uh, I have to my right, uh, Dr. Melissa Wisted. She's our Executive Director of Academic Services. Uh, and she is also our designated um, school system blueprint coordinator, um, all things blueprint in addition to Title I, uh, advanced academics, college career readiness, what am I missing? Early childhood. Early childhood. Uh, and to the right, we have Dr. Uh, Kim Ferguson, who's our Executive Director of Social Emotional Learning this evening. And uh, to my far left, I have Ms. Uh, Allison Myers, our Executive Director of Special Education. So I hope I've assembled the team to address any question that you may have this evening for our budget. If we could go into the next slide. Uh, we know that in the wake of the interruption of the last couple of years that uh, we are striving hard to uh, address our achievement. Uh, and I'm proposing a variety of targeted initiatives under our strategic plan learning accountability and results uh, to accelerate our student learning as we continue to move forward uh, in the wake of, of the last couple of years. Next slide, please. What you have on the screen before you know is our blueprint. And our blueprint is a transformative legislative um, action uh, that is uh, truly changing the way that we provide services to our students at every level. You'll see the five pillars of the blueprint, and you hear us refer to them often. And you will continue to hear us refer to those blueprint pillars, um, not just in this budget cycle, but in the upcoming cycles. This particular budget cycle, we are really focusing on uh, early childhood education, uh, college and career readiness pathways, and of course, ensuring that students have additional resources that they need depending upon um, their particular um, community. Um, and so we'll talk more about those particular initiatives. Next slide, please. Tracy rang the bell on me, or Mr. Brusades <laughs> rang the bell. Your time is up. Um, okay, well, as we, if, you, if ugh, ugh, let me try that again. If you look at the screen before, you really have these in key buckets. I'm just going to take a minute to talk about them to kind of just center us on what are the things that we are asking for in this budget and what are those shifts in, in the way we are um, uh, placing our funds to that align with the blueprint. So first and foremost, we have our early childhood education initiatives under blueprint. We are looking to expand full day preschool programs as we know that that really sets students up on a trajectory of success um, over the course of the many years that they spend with us in BCPS. In addition to supporting um, an expansion of full day preschool programs, which is a multi-year process for us, uh, we are also looking to um, move towards meeting an elevated requirement for our pre-K para uh, pre-K helpers and para educators. Under the blueprint, uh, we know that the highest performing school systems around the globe um, really invest in early childhood and they ensure that the, the individuals that are working with our earliest learners have high levels of education and training. And in the spirit of that, Blueprint is asking uh, that uh, pre-K classrooms be supported by uh, paraprofessionals um, who have either a a um, AA degree, or help me out, Dr. Wisted? Uh, Child Development Associates, or CDA, it's called. I, I can never remember that, so thank you. Um, so in that effort, uh, we are working to try to uh, position those pre-K paras for next school year. Uh, we currently have hourly um, employees, pre-K helpers who uh, serve in our pre-K classrooms, and we have a multi-year plan whereby uh, we will have the funding allocated for our paras, and for any of our pre-K helpers who may already meet those higher credentials, they will be, then be able to move into a para position. For any of our pre-K helpers who aspire to reach that credential by the timeline, which I think is 2025, 26 school year. 2025, 26 school year. Thank you. Um, and uh, that we are have a training program that they can access to work their way to meet that credential. 
Next uh, topic I want to talk about here is community schools. Community schools is a tremendous um, initiative, and it really addresses the pillar of providing more resources for our students in their home school community. And we know that when you support a child, that also means you support the community. And so we will be expanding the number of community schools that provide wraparound services. Um, in addition, uh, school-based community school facilitators and health services uh, support uh, those 71 schools. Uh, additionally, CTE, career technical education, is a huge focus under uh, Blueprint because we know that the, the pathway to careers, some careers students can enter immediately after high school while other careers require two and four year degrees and some credentials even um, higher graduate degrees. As CTE, we are um, working in partnership with our county government workforce development to request CTE site coordinators to help ensure that our students are accessing internships, Maryland apprenticeship opportunities, and really engaging in what it's like to be in the workforce environment or the, uh, the working environment as uh, young adults. So they're getting that very real world experience so that when they cross our stage and get that diploma, they also have a professional credential in their hand and have an entry into uh, the workforce. Next, we're going to talk about transitional supplemental instruction. This is often shortened to TSI funds. It's really important that when you're referring to these supplemental funds, instructional funds, that you uh, distinguish them from targeted school improvement. Um, and so I just want to um, ensure that the board understands that acronym can be used uh, for two different things. In this context, we're using it for the supplemental instructional funds. Uh, these funds uh, help us provide additional reading specialists and mac math specialists um, that are resource teachers at the school level. Uh, please know that we're going to refer to resource teachers and not all resource teachers are housed uh, or assigned to central staff. In these instances, they are school-based resource teachers. Um, and then advanced placement exams, ensuring that we provide uh, the funding for all students who are taking advanced placement courses to also be able to take the college board exam uh, to achieve that recognition and, and credential um, in terms of possibility of college credit. Next slide, please. Uh, I'm sorry, could you go back one slide? There's a really important point I want to draw your attention to. These blueprint initiatives, the money comes from the state to support these initiatives. Um, and in fact, Blueprint funding will be providing $32.2 million to our operating budget to support these initiatives. I think it's important to understand that that's state revenue coming in to support these. We know one of the key factors of Blueprint is that along with the state funding comes very specific guidelines on how that money can be used and that that money is driven directly to schools. Next slide, please. Here is, um, on this slide you're, are my requests that are not blueprint funding, um, funded, and that these are requests that I'm asking uh, that would ultimately come from uh, county tax revenue. Um, first and foremost, to establish, um, expand our services to our English learners. Uh, we know our English learner population is our fastest gro growing student group. We have approximately 11,000. Uh, English learners, and it is growing every day. Uh, I do understand that you monitor our English learner population growth, so you're well aware. We are in the process of working to ensure that English learners have full access to all the after-school curriculars, after-school tutoring, athletics, and all the resources that come with um, their community, their home school. Um, for many of our English learners, they also attend schools. Their home schools are schools where the community schools programs are in place. We are requesting an additional 36 ESOL teacher positions to support our growing ESOL enrollment. Um, across our school system. Additionally, um, I'm requesting funds uh, for those of you who were with us 
prior to the um, new board joining us, uh, we are in the process of moving towards evidence-based highly rated curriculum to be in alignment with the state regulations. But not just because it's the state regulations, but we know that more rigorous curriculum is the path to our students performing more successfully and having those true college and career readiness skills. Um, and so to that end, we have been piloting a product. Um, we have also been requested to pilot additional products of which we have begun. So we are in the process of piloting to determine what would be the best product for our students to ensure that they have a truly um, standards aligned, rigorous program uh, that is complete with the resources. Um, I won't belabor that point, I get very passionate about it. But the point is, I'm asking for the resources so that when we identify the product and everyone is um, agreeable to what product we're going to use, that the money is in place to purchase it because we need to identify the product, have the funds, purchase, and then roll it out. And ideally in time for next school year. Um, and then last but not least, um, we, as many of you know, we were um, fortunate to have access to the Maryland Leeds Grant uh, from the state MSDE. Um, and part of our applying for that grant and getting the maximum amount that we could, we as a, a community said that we would provide matching funds. Um, and that is one of our requests, the matching 1.5 funds um, to make good on the commitment we made when we applied for that grant. Um, a, a, excuse me. Additionally, we are also asking for 1.5 positions uh, to, for the new Northeast Middle School and seven assistant principals and support staff to respond to increasing enrollment across schools. Oh, and one last thing, thank you. <laughs> uh, special ed funding. Every year, um, the cost, the tuition cost of non-public um, placement goes up, and so we are asking for additional funds to handle the inflationary cost of non-public placements. Is there anything else I should add? Okay, thank you. <laughs> Next slide. Uh, before we ha hand it over to the deputy, I think this is my Q&A opportunity, Dr. Williams, is that correct? Um, so I guess we could go back, uh, Ms. Gover. So that's what I'm asking for for our children. I think I'm here for questions at so, this point. Ms. Dominowski. I just had a question about the ELA curriculum. Yes. Is this going to re replace the open court reading curriculum? No, so open court, it's really important to understand that literacy, and Ms. I'll give you a moment. Um, it's really important to understand that when we're building uh, our reading skills at the elementary, there's sort of two pieces that you need to recognize. There's the foundation pieces, which is really where we help students, and this is where I need your expertise to come in. Um, to talk about what exactly foundation is compared to our comprehension. Sure, that's the phonemic awareness, phonics, and fluency pieces and vocabulary. And then, of course, the language comprehension is um, reading comprehension and then the writing and language usage. So the, the short answer is no. Open Court is here to stay. We're seeing some promising results with our dibbles, and so any curriculum that we purchase is to address the language comprehension portion of the ELA curriculum. I follow up. No, I'm glad, I'm glad to hear that because I've heard that everyone, like most good things about open court. Um, mm -hmm. Well, I also want to ask, has anybody, has it been researched the open court phonics port, part of the um, curriculum to work together since it, you know, they're the same? It would kind of. Sh sure, right. So there's that natural sense of would, would you use the two? Um, so we have an evaluation process. And again, I'll invite Ms. Shea to provide more details for you on where we are with that. Sure. So. Um, the answer is yes, that was a part of the stakeholder review committee. I also want to make sure I don't go to uh, procurement jail by misspeaking around what um, can be followed up. Um, but one thing that's important for the stakeholder criteria is that any curriculum we purchase has to have evidence, uh, a highly rated evidence for all grade levels. And so some curriculum, such as open court, might not have evidence through grade five. And so that is, it. yes, it was considered. It is not one of the two that we are piloting currently. Other questions for CNI? So the thank you for the clarification of TSI versus TSI. So <laughs> on the screen where it has a transitional supplemental instruction, those additional reading specialists and math school-based resource teachers aren't necessarily going to the TSI tar designated schools. 
Yes, that's correct. Um, and thank you for making sure everyone understands right. that. And then, so where are they going? How are we determining where those additional reading specialists and math school-based resource teachers would go? Sure, and it's important to understand that when we first got the targeted supplemental instructional funds, uh, approximately three years ago, what, is that right? Um, they came in the form of a, of a reimbursable grant, which is different than how that money is flowing to us in this next budget cycle, and that uh, really, um, is important to understand because when the funds came into us as, as a grant, we had to identify at that time where these funds went. And of course, they went directly to schools in alignment with the spirit of Blueprint. That was really the first wave of Blueprint funding coming in. Um, and so at that time, we identified uh, large elementary schools. And again, I'll invite Ms. Shea to add because she's uh, worked very closely with our budget team on where exactly those resources are identified. Thank you. So um, the legislation and blueprint for transitional supplemental instruction specifies that it has to be used to support small group instruction in grades K to 3 only. So the reason we primarily identified large elementary schools to have a second reading specialist is because typically one works with primary grades and one works with secondary. So that was a way that we could identify that distinction to make sure that we met the criteria of the transitional supplemental instruction. So the schools identified include um, a second reading specialist at schools that are considered large. I believe the original number was 700 for enrollment, but um, that may shift, of course. Enrollment shifts every day. And then in addition, we did identify schools. Um, at the time, it was nine schools that had an additional 7.5 positions, some of which were a .5, and that was to support math instruction. And we worked collaboratively with the Department of Schools and DRAA to look at different data points around uh, teacher turnover, um, math, obviously math data. In the primary grades, in particular, we used um, anecdotal um, record keeping of teachers to talk about um, identified needs, and then also <coughs> primary grade math, map data. Uh, because, of course, it's supporting K through 3, and we don't start using MCAP until grade 3. And then the third way that we identified it, um, this year we were able to work collaboratively with Title I, the Office of Title I. Uh, we try to braid funds wherever we can to maximize those dollars and support students. And what happened this year was some of our Title I schools were seeing their overall allocation um, would seem like it was being pinched as we added more schools and as some of the costs increase. So when you think about things like pay raises or um, per hour increases, that has an impact on how far you can stretch your Title I dollars at a school. And so what we were able to do this year is move some of those positions at Title I schools that had been funded out of a school's Title I budget to the transitional supplemental instruction funds therefore freeing up some of those Title I funds at the school to use for a wide range of programming, parent nights, things for fourth and fifth grade, things that went beyond the scope of this grant. And I will just add, um, when you look at the responses, the written responses to the budget questions that had been submitted, you can find the list of schools um, and their allocations by reading specialists and math specialists on pages 41, 42, and 43 for your reference at some point. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And one other question, if this is going to be answered by somebody else, just cut me off. So um, on the slides before um, that you got up here, it said reduce central office resource teachers by 3.6 million, and I understand we need to find places to cut. Are we gonna see a list of the resource, I know I requested a list of all resource teachers in different offices. My concern being that we need to build teachers' capacity, so if we're reducing the resource teachers in course areas, how is that gonna allow us to build capacity? I know the efficiency report really praised the residency model that you used for resource teachers, and that was a model that was moving us um, and it was a great model for the resource teacher, but it needs people to make that happen. So um, is there a place where the list of resource teachers per office is located? Yes, so uh, there is, and thank you for the opportunity to address that. Um, if on the written responses to questions, you can find that chart um, on page 51. Your question is an excellent one because it really is fundamentally to move the quality of our classroom instruction requires instructional support. Um, and coaching. And so it really will be incumbent upon us to leverage at the secondary level the power of department chairs uh, to be that uh, ground level instructional coach to help support uh, capacity building. At the elementary level, uh, we have uh, identified um, teacher leaders who can help with that. Of course, the challenge is 
the time to be able to go in and help support their colleagues. And so uh, it is a little bit more challenging, and we have to think creatively at the building level, how do we leverage the, the resource um, and expertise in the, at the school level to help support that um, as we have fewer people to deploy to do any type of residency model. Uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with what we mean by the residency model, uh, we had uh, approximately five, six years ago, uh, moved to an innovative model whereby a resource teacher would spend three weeks at a school. And so uh, they were on deployment to a school for th those three weeks where they were working very specifically um, on instructional uh, matters at that school that were identified by the principal in partnership with the school executive director. Uh, and the, the resource teacher spent time there settling in and really supporting the teachers participating in professional learning communities, data team meetings, uh, modeling uh, teaching strategies uh, with the idea of working in partnership of a sustainability plan once that resource teacher was pulled back from that deployment and then redeployed to another school. So um, that is what we're referring to as a residency model for anyone who may not um, know what that references. Thank you. And silly question probably, what are you looking at that you're telling us the page numbers to follow up? Do we have that? Okay. Okay. All right. That's fine. I have it. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> there, um, I just want to add to that, that response. I'm so appreciative of the resource teacher residency. Um, but to the board, my first request for my budget when I first came was to trying to build capacity within every school so that you had that capacity in every school, aka staff development teacher, looking at our reading specialists, trying to explore mathematics specialists at the elementary school, and to talk about what does that look like at the, depart at the secondary level, um, team leader, department chairs at the middle school, department chairs at the high school. So I just wanted to add to that discussion. Thank you. Uh, just to follow up, Ms. Shea, you were talking about um, TSI funding and reading specialists. Um, did you say that elementary schools with 700 kids or more were provided with uh, a second resource, like basically specialists to go through K through three reading specifically? Yeah, so I said that the 700 number was my best recollection. I can follow up on the exact number, but the basic premise was that large elementary schools were given a second reading specialist to primarily focus on primary grades. And and when you did that, you just did you, did was it just a clean split the or was it shared duty across all all, all For the grade individuals? Levels? Right. Yes, so um, it's really a site-based decision. So the grant specifies that the primary role of these funds needs to be for K through three. Mm -hmm. In each school, oftentimes those two reading specialists work collaboratively looking at data and also work collaboratively with their special educators and the general educators to devise that plan. And then what we do annually is we ask those funded by these funds to identify the number of students in K through three that they serve. So that can be a combination of pull-out services or push-in. So it's... Um, we don't um, advertise for the positions to say you are only being hired for this or sure. that because the principal has some agency around using data to be responsive, um, but that's the expectation of the grant. And then the last part of the question, so Title I funds, you were talking about braiding them and kind of combining to get the most you can. Sure. Did you add yet another reading resource teacher to, to help tackle that especially important K through three area? So that's a great question. So these funds show a shift in funding to funding. There's, they're not new additional positions. Um, however, some of our Title I schools, so if I just used an example of you know, Cherry Tree Elementary as a Title I school, they're given an allocation of funding. They may have previously used their school-based funding to fund a second reading specialist if they were a Title I school that fell below that threshold. So maybe they had 500 students. What we were able to do is to say, we're going to move that position to this funding and give you back the dollars in your Title I funding so you still get that reading specialist that you identified as a need for your school, but now you've freed up those funds to support other programming in your building. Okay, thank you. Sure. Ms. Dominowski? Oh, I'm sorry, Dr. Savoy, did you have a question? Yes. Okay, and then we'll... 
I think I heard you say you have 11,500 ESOL students? Approximately, Approximately. yes. It's 10% uh, of our student population. Okay. How many teachers do you have to accommodate these students, like the ratio of teacher to student? Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> we currently have 212 ESOL FTEs. Right now, the ratio is 54 to 1. Uh, with the 36 positions that we're requesting, if we get all 36, the overall ratio would go to 52 to 1. The reason it doesn't go down much more is because of that tremendous enrollment increase that we're trying to balance against. And then um, that average of 52 to 1 would actually be, in the elementary school, the ratio would be closer to 54 to 1, and middle high school would be 51 to 1. Okay, thank you. Yes. Ms. Domanowski. Yes, we've heard from um, a lot of public comment about the advanced um, academics. Advanced academics. Um, can you uh, expand upon why we you've decided to go from five professional to one and keep one for? Um, is it, was there anything else that was discussed to? Um, that, instead of shortening that staff up. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity to share how we we discern where to cut when, when reductions are required. Um, so it's important to understand that our resource te our central resource teachers really provide two functions. One is to directly teach students. And I have quite a number of resource teachers that if you were to just look on paper, you would think uh, Dr. McComas has more teachers than she needs. But a good number of our resource teachers actually are teachers of record for our students at the Baltimore County Detention Center, students in our e-learning program, students in our VLP program. Uh, they also directly teach students in supplemental programs like our outdoor education and our STAR Lab. Um, and so I just ask that you keep that uh, in the back of your mind that we do have quite a number of resource teachers that are central resource teachers who every day are directly teaching students a particular program. Besides that, our resource teachers teach teachers, or I should say coach teachers, right? Because they're coaching their colleagues to make sure that we can build that capacity that Dr. Williams was talking about because we have many new teachers and it takes time to become a masterful teacher and support. Um, and so when we have to make reductions, uh, we first and foremost preserve the resource teachers that are providing direct service to our students because to cut them is to eliminate programming uh, directly to students, which of course we all want to avoid. Next uh, really comes what are our priority areas? ELA and mathematics are truly critical areas. We know that when you elevate uh, students of capacity around literacy, that their achievement uh, rises in all other content areas as well. So ELA and, and mathematics certainly are key areas that uh, we seek to preserve. Then we start moving on to what are the other assessed areas in science and social studies, which are also supportive of literacy. Um, then we move on to where are their offices that if we cut, they are left with no one to support those programs across 178 schools. Um, and so you can see we have a series of priorities that we go down. When you look at page, I forget what page it was, I, I quoted, I think maybe 54. 51. Um, when you look at the chart, you're going to see, um, and the question was posed that was asked over a number of years, so you can see over time um, how we have tried to um, very surgically um, address the needs of reduction while also trying to preserve, of course, first and foremost, service to students, uh, second, service uh, to our teachers in the critical areas, and then um, program support. Uh, so you'll see that, and um, and in terms of advanced academics, their their services were on um, under consideration, just like all the other areas as well. You will see, uh, for example, in one case, our Office of College and Career Readiness. I think we have totally eliminated uh, resource teachers to support that program. And so they are challenging decisions to make. Uh, they are made with thoughtfulness. Um, and uh, I've explained sort of our process of prioritizing where to preserve. Um, I understand that. I'm, I'm looking at just kind of the salary budget wise. You've cut f um, four, t four teachers or four resource teachers, but you've, you haven't cut in half the salary. So essentially, because um, it goes from 618 to 321, and you go from 6 to 2. So I'm just curious, um, could there have been more? Uh, I, I just 
you're, you have one uh, professional resource teacher that's going to now have to train all teachers teaching advanced academics. So, can I add one thing? Yeah, and mm -hmm. then, and certainly I would, Wit can answer better, but some of that might reflect our resource teachers being funded from different sources. So, that's something that I think. So, Mr. let Chandler, me ask. Um, yeah, <laughs> can answer. <laughs> but Thank but, you. I, but I was going to add me. just a curricular excuse piece. Me. Oh, oh, excuse sure, me sorry. for a second. I just want to hear from the, I want the answer from Mr. Tanleaf or Mr. Hartlove, that question about the salary piece. Yeah, just just for clarification, repeat that so we make sure we're answering it right. Yes. I'm just trying to understand cutting four teachers and the salary is less, I mean, you haven't cut the salaries in half and the wages in half. You've gone from 618 to 321, but you've gone from six FTEs to two. So you, I would think that would be more of a, be more of a cut. Than Did you say the page number that you're looking sure, at, please? Sure, it's 209. 209. Okay. Appendix E, Curriculum and, Instru and Instruction in Advanced Academics. Well, I just want to clarify, it's three um, resource teachers. There's still one resource teacher remaining. I'll find it. I'll so three were reduced from the four that were originally there. It, it says here five and one, and then one and one. So while they're looking for that answer, um, maybe we entertain another question. Okay. As they explore that answer. I will, uh, if I just may add one quality um, point to the discussion, um, is that our ELA office and mathematics office works with advanced academics to also help infuse and provide that capacity building. So that's part of the strategy of shifting. Thank you. Thank you. And for ELA resource teachers on that same grid, you have um, cut to seven. Now, how are they distributed K to 12? Go ahead, may I? Um, there will be three elementary, three secondary, and one dedicated to collaborate with special education on intervention, specifically K to 12. So if we get, or when we get, a new reading series for K to 5, how many did you say we had? I would have three for 108 right. elementary schools. So we're going to get a brand new series, but very little support to ensure that it's implemented as intended with results that we need. Okay, that wasn't quite, it was just, okay, thank you. Other questions for CNI? Um, yes, Ms. Joes? Thank you. I'm not going to ask you a great question just so that I'm clear. <laughs> I'm looking at your um, AP courses, which will be offered free. I, are these just the courses that are offered by the AP board, or are there additional that you could add to this list? Uh, go ahead. <laughs> so the, the money that's being requested is to pay for the examinations of the students. So the courses are always free for the students to take, but for them to take the exam, there's a fee for that. So that's what the money is about. The list that's provided, I don't know what page. Page 20. <laughs> um, is 34 out of 38 possible advanced placement courses are offered in Baltimore County Public Schools. And the four that are not offered are listed at the bottom. Okay, thank you. Um, we, we do have a little bit of clarification. Um, so, it, it, Ms. Dominowski, if you go on that same page, if you go down to um, instructional salaries and wages, which is where those uh, resource teachers would be captured, you notice um, we're going from 400 down to 111, and, uh, and that corresponds to the, 4 FTE, the reduction of 4 FTE. So we, we went down about 300,000, maybe not quite $300,000 for 4 for four FTE. Right, but there are four professional positions, not staff. So I just, it just doesn't really equate to me. It seems like a professional would probably make more than a support staff, and you cut four of them, but not even 300,000 from the budget. And actually, it's like a 20-something percent increase in those those two position salaries. Um, so we'll have to, I don't have all the details in front of me, but that isn't all pure salary. Salaries would also include um, 
you know, for instance, if you had, if you were paying for summer school, if you're paying stipends, if you're doing curriculum development, I'm not saying that's here, but things in salaries are not just straight salaries. So there could be uh, contractual employees that are paid and that would all hit the salary bucket. Well, that's separated contracted services. Wouldn't that be part of contractual salaries? Uh, it depends on how it's structured. A lot of some, uh, a contract would fall under contractual, but we have employees that we pay from our payroll and they're contracted, they're not FTEs. Um, and those would get paid uh, under salaries. So I guess there could be more transparency as far as what the salary number goes into. Because, I mean, it doesn't, there's, I, I don't have anything to base it off of other than the support staff or the FTE totals to think that those salaries are that. Right, so important. for a question like that, to get the very granular buildup of that, we would have to go pull that apart and get back to you. But, you know, the budget book to show those kind of details, instead of 300 pages, you know, it'd be 1,000 pages. There's any line item could have lots of details behind it. So there's, you know, some summary level that we need to show. We try to explain what's changing. Uh, and if more details are needed, we can provide them, certainly. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, CNI. Thank you. Yes, and, and next up, it's Dr. Yarbrough, yeah. Deputy Superintendent, and she has several areas that she's uh, going to be reviewing. Good evening, Chair Lichter, Vice Chair Harvey, Dr. Williams, Superintendent, and members of the board. Thank you this evening to provide us with the opportunity to answer any questions that you might have regarding uh, additional requests from the Office of the Deputy Superintendent. Um, with me this evening, we have Dr. Zarchin, Chief of Schools, Dr. Grimm, representing Transportation, Mr. Dixit, Facilities, and Mr. McCall, Human Resources. As we work to articulate the strategic teaching and learning initiatives in alignment of programs and resources to deliver efficient and effective services to students and schools, we present the following requests. In the area of learning accountability and results, we'll begin with the request for expansion through schools. Next slide, please. You'll note the new Northeast Middle School planning, adding two positions, one and a half to be exact, assistant principals and support staff in schools, as well as Watershed Charter School expanding to add the sixth grade. I want to pause to see if there are any questions on this slide. You're, Mr. You're, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lichter. The watershed chart, if you could bring that slide back on again, you added a sixth grade. Is that something that was required by the blueprint, or is that uh, something that the board approved, the sixth grade? That's part of the expansion plan, the long-range planning that had uh, different grades in different years. Uh, in the plan, it includes to add the sixth grade as the next step. So now it would be only up to the sixth grade, correct? Short. Correct. All right, thank you. And the seven FTEs, seven additional system principals, they're going to Watershed and the new Northeast Middle? Or are there other schools where the seven are going? The seven additional FTE, where you have assistant principals and support staff in schools, you'll have clerical, Hampton Elementary School, Honeygo Elementary School, 
Dundalk High School and Parkville High School due to increased enrollment. And then you'll have one additional assistant principal for the same reasons, um, particularly elementary schools that they've gone over 700, Honeygo Elementary School and Hampton Elementary School. Okay, thanks for that clarification. You're welcome. Okay. We can continue. Go ahead. Next slide, please. In the areas of operational excellence, we will begin with transportation. Next slide, please. For transportation, you'll notice the mobile and web-based application system to provide access to all community members, staff, and students. An additional one additional fleet mechanic. Replacement vehicles for transportation, information technology, and grounds and bus contractor fees. In the areas of facility, we have facilities, construction, maintenance, critical support, staffing, building service workers for the new elementary schools, contract maintenance, housekeeping and grounds, facilities, school support specialist, one, access to energy management software, and three one-time funding requests. New school startup and moving costs, the boardroom technology upgrades, and facility space management software. I'll pause for any questions. Mr. Kuhn. Uh, just real quick, the um, energy management software, can someone just explain what that is and what it brings to us? Good question. We have an existing software known as uh, Energy Watchdog. We are upgrading it to a higher level of package. It compiles data for all energy commodities by school. It, com it provides you with the energy efficiency factor for all of the schools, and it helps us in identifying schools that can need energy improvement. And if you recall, we uh, implemented an energy performance contracting worth $100 million over a period of four or five years. And all of the schools, the energy efficiency, that's the cost savings that were projected, an independent audit has indicated that we have met our goal. And the success of that program is because of the extensive energy data that we maintain. Just to follow on, so so that information is available to you in, in reports for across the entire system? That's true. And we continue trying to improve upon the reports that we have. All right, thank you. Any other? Go ahead. Thank you. Next slide, please. In the area of human resources, the request is for human resources, clerical support and contractual employees, as well as software licenses for recruitment platform, as well as our evaluation and registration system. Have any questions? That concludes our section. Thank you. At this time, we'll turn it over to Mr. Pedro Agosto and the Deforma Department of Information Technology. Thank you. Thank you. general question, um, but it's related to some of the expenses that the last team and this team are presenting, maybe for Dr. Williams, if I may ask. Go ahead. Um, there's significant systems expenditures that I'm wondering if we have pursued 
grant funding for. I know sometimes um, those opportunities exist, and I was wondering if Dr. Williams, if anyone on your team has pursued those, or if that is a staff resource that could be beneficial um, if there's a, been a cost-benefit analysis of additional staff to pursue those so grant staff, opportunities. Staff members, chiefs have looked at different ways of funding. Our biggest source most of the time is through MSDE. Um, that's as much as I can share at this time. Yeah. And, Would um, it be helpful for the board to advocate um, with the state for additional grant opportunities? We're hearing about significant investments in systems, and they're terrific systems. Parents have been asking for um, bus apps, you know, transportation apps that we're hearing about, but I'm wondering if we could help absorb some of those costs if there are any grant opportunities. So uh, let's pursue. allow the team to present, sure. and we'll hold that thought and that recommendation, Ms. Hen. We'll be happy to follow up so we can have a complete response to your question. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, good evening, Chair Lichter, good evening. Vice Chair Harvey, and members of the board, Dr. Williams. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm Pedro Augusto, Chief Information Officer and the Head of the Div uh, Division of Information Technology. And here to my right is Jody Obenstein, who's our Director of the Technology Office. So she's responsible for all of our day-to-day -day support for um, desktop services and anything out in the field. So we have a very intimate group here today. I don't have a lot of folks <laughs> in the, with all the tables. Fit the so. chairs. Um, That's right. Yes. So if we go to the next slide, please. Yeah. So uh, we have very targeted uh, request for this budget uh, cycle. And it's to support the area of operational excellence. Uh, next slide, please. So we do have three areas or three asks. And um, the first one is the classroom display panels. So in the spring of 2022, the board approved a contract to implement the interactive display panels. The initial funding for that year was covered through BAT funds for this past fiscal year with the understanding that uh, the subsequent funding would be incorporated into the operating budget. So we are now asking for the $767,000 uh, to cover the ongoing project for the, the uh, implementation of the interactive display panels. The next bullet is the IT network support. So these are three FTEs that we're asking for. The first one is for the IT network support. Uh, that resource would be added to the existing team of uh, four full-time field network analysts that we currently have. Uh, they are um, on board to support the over 200 locations that we have across all of BCPS and the uh, network devices that are included in all those 200 locations. In addition to the day-to-day -day operations, uh, the techs are also responsible for the um, upgrade and deployment of our networking um, equipments, uh, equipment, the switches and so forth that we have to put out in all of the locations. So this additional resource would be there to support day-to-day -day plus the increased uh, need for tech support that we're going to have uh, for the implementation. The other um, two positions, the business analyst and software engineer, are requested to support the, um, the area, our um, office of uh, development support. They are needed to provide the ongoing support as we're looking at the HRIS modernization, ERP modernization, as well as um, the increase in request for um, development and changes in existing systems. Uh, that is um, $300,000 for those three FTEs. And then lastly, we're requesting $1.7 million for the uh, upgrade or the implementation of our IT network firewalls and associated software licenses for the SAS component of that. Um, the network firewalls will go into the high schools. One of the things that we were looking at is uh, to increase our security posture. We wanted to segment the network. So in case we had any issue, security issue in a particular high school, we could lock down the network. So that would be the only impacted area. So the way to do that is implement uh, the additional firewalls in the high school areas in addition to the three main firewalls that we have today. 
and I'll entertain any questions at this point. Good evening and thank you for the presentation. The business analyst and software engineer are new positions or additional business, additional people in that role? They are, so we do have business analysts and development staff. These would be add-ons to existing staff. Thank you. Ms. Demonowski. Um, you mentioned the 1.7 million. Yes. Is this just for the um, firewalls for high school? Yes, so this is uh, the increase for um, firewalls for high schools plus the additional software that goes along with and services that go with it. Has there been any, um, I guess, thought about upgrading the firewalls for elementary level? I know I'm hearing from parents that kids are able to get to YouTube, um, Roblox, a, a, a mimic form of Minecraft on their school computer on the school Wi-Fi and it's causing issues at home when they come home and where, you know, sometimes at that, you know, K through 12 to K through three, they don't have a screen, like they don't, you know, entertain screen time at home. And it's a fight because you're supposed to bring your Chromebook home to do homework or to charge it or what, for whatever reason. So I wanted to know if there's, that was being addressed. Well, it's, uh, so, well, I'll, I'll start by saying that the firewalls will address, um, what I'll call um, improper network use of networks um, so that we see um, malicious um, attacks or, or um, a, in denial of service. So we're, we're getting a string of, of just bad traffic coming in trying to disrupt our services. Firewalls will catch that. Um, in terms of the controls that we have at the device level, which is what you're talking about with the Chromebooks, I'll let Ms. Obenstein just talked a little bit about what we currently have in place um, with the, um, uh, the, the cloud, um, management. cloud management and then also the event detection at the device level. Absolutely, so it's a great question that you're asking. And one of the things that we are looking at is the protections we currently have in place. So that would be things like the filtering, which limits the inappropriate access to those sites, as well as some of the controls that Google offers us centrally to manage the access to specific parts of that device. So some of the things that help us with this are some examples of when that's being used, and that's not for here, but we'll be um, taking that item from you and doing some more research. But that is different than the firewalls that Mr. Augusto was talking about earlier. Yeah, and I'll, I'll yeah, I'll, I'll make that. I'll reiterate. So, <clears throat> in general, when we do get um, questions or potential issues, the, f the the very first thing we always ask for are specific examples. If we can um, get examples, to allow us to troubleshoot. If we can actually have names of people that are going through items, it helps with our troubleshooting efforts and helps us identify if there's something there that we need to close the gap on. Other questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. That was slide 20 of 21. So. I'm just going to summarize if that's okay. Yes, that. please. Okay. So I, I'm. Uh, thank you uh, to all of our staff, and thank you for all the thoughtful questions. And I'm. Surprised that we were able to get through everything tonight, so that's that's good. Um, just to let you know, obviously our, our uh, budget book is out on the website. All the questions uh, that have been submitted to, to date from the board, we've answered. We have a few that came in later today. We weren't able to get those. It's kind of a monumental effort. We have all of our staff pulling to get the answers to your questions. So, uh, But the ones that we, I think we received as of this morning, um, we've answered and you and you have those answers so um, and then Monday night we have a uh, budget committee meeting where we can um, we haven't set our agenda yet but we uh, we're gonna have fun I'm sure <laughs> so I have a naive question as sure. okay. so what are the next steps as far as so we we've gotten messages from the county executive the budget's too big it needs to be so where do we go from here well the, really, the next step is, I believe it's the, it was the date of, um, 
The 28th is the, the next date. Right. February 28th is the next official date. Everything we do between now and then would be information. The, 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 the committee meeting is, a, is an information. Um, if we at the next meeting, if we have anything on the agenda, it would be information. On the 28th, the board will adopt their, your official request in effect, and that's what it is. And then that goes to the county government. Um, anything we hear like, you know, comments in the news and so on, those are just comments. They don't really, you know, you can respond to those and you, you, you can use those in your thought process and, you, you know, in your decision-making process, but they're just kind of weighing in on what they've seen so far. Um, but no, you will, uh, you will adopt your official budget on the 28th and that's the last time you'll touch it until we get to the, until we, uh, till the end of the process. If we, um, really it's more in the county's hand, the county, uh, uh executive goes from there. He, uh, can, he can modify that budget as, as he has done in past years. Then it goes to the county council for approval and then that becomes our, our budget. So if we don't modify it, there's a good chance the county executive will modify it. Yeah, you know he's 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 going to look at what we've what we've put out on the table, and he's going to look at it compared to what he believes is, and um, he's going to more than likely make make reductions um, down to a certain level. Is is probably what he's 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 going to do. But we're giving him the power to make the reductions versus us making those decisions. Yeah, I think that's a very good point. You know, you can, and this is strategy, and I don't, I'll just go my own, this is my, this is Chris Hartlove talking for, for a second. You can put many things in the budget. That's your, that's your priority. You can do that if you want. But then you have to look at the reality of, is it going to get funded? And if it's, if, if there are a lot of number, a lot of, of items on that list, then this, the county executive may have to make those decisions as to what to cut versus prioritizing. I, I do believe you want something aspirational, but also maybe in the reality of, of, of realistic. So that way, if he, if he has to reduce, um, at least the, 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 the choices are narrowed down to your priorities versus his, his priorities. Do you want to say something, Dr. Williams? Your I finger. really don't, okay. but I will say this. I'm going to say it anyway. Mm -hmm. This is the Board of Education budget that's going forward to the county executive. And what was helpful that last year, let me just talk about last year, the board decided to prioritize one item, and that one item was the people. So as we're getting questions. We can go on record based on your action from previous year that please focus. If you do, if you can't do everything, please focus on this one item. And last year it was about the people. And so that was shared with the county executive. So I just want to offer that whatever happens in the process between now and the end of February, I will ask, or Mr. Hartlove will ask, um, We've done, you took my budget, tweaked it, did whatever you need to do. Now it's the Board of Education budget. But one of us will ask, thank you, Board, but can you also identify what's that one thing, one item that you really want to say we need to prioritize um, if there are any potential reductions? That seemed to have helped last year's process. I would offer that again um, as we go through the adoption of the board's budget. Would you agree, Mr. Hart? I, I agree with that 100%. And, and as we go through the process over the next uh, few weeks, we will update you on any revisions to numbers. Um, uh, an item that may come out during that period of time is the spending affordability. So we could, we could probably update you on that. That's not something you don't have to act on it, but it's just information. Like I said, everything between now and the 28th is solely information to help you make your final decisions. So there's a long time between now and the 28th. We have a board meeting on the 14th of February, which is in three weeks. I know that we sent you more questions that you weren't. Right. So does it make sense to make a motion to add another work session to the February 14th to do some of this work that you're talking about now instead of waiting until February 28th to, to make the adjustments? I think that's a good suggestion and anything that you can, any, we will cost out anything, but timing, you know, it's, right. so, so, so it's if three you, weeks from now, if you right. have an idea today, 
let us know something you would like to add because then we can give you a cost. And that cost can inform you as to, do I want to ask for this or do I not want to ask for it? Or do I want to maybe revise my, my request down a little bit or up a little bit? So, um, but time is, you know, is our staff, the budget right. staff's ally. If, you know, if they have time, they can get you the answer. So I think to, to find out, I guess I have to make a motion to add a work session to February 14th agenda on the FY24 operating budget. If you're asking, I'd move that or second it. Okay, so Sorry. second. Madam Chair. Any further discussion? Ms. Gober, can we take a roll call vote on the motion to add a work session of the budget operating budget on the February 14th Board of Ed meeting? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. Motion passes. And I'd just like to thank staff for all the time and effort they put into that. I know we sent a lot of questions with a lot of details. So um, if this will give us some time to get really go through those answers, probably send you more, knowing we have three weeks before that February 14th. So thank so, you very much. So I would like to associate myself with uh, Chair Lichter comments, 47 pages of questions and answers um, were a lot. Um, I would just ask board members, please try to adhere to our time frame because if, if you don't, we cannot guarantee to have a complete response. We want to make sure we have a complete response. So some of you, I'm not looking at anybody particular, but you know your answers will be provided definitely. But um, it takes a lot of work to make sure we understand the question, and sometimes we don't, so we kind of talk about it and then to provide a complete response. So thank you all. all right. So we need to send those questions right away to give staff. You didn't. You. Yeah, we oh, we had a mar we right. we had a marathon meeting this I'm morning. Sure you it did. was questions. I think for two and a half hours okay. just going through questions. So. Okay. So again, <laughs> thank you to staff. Thank you ahead of time for the preparation for the February 14th. But um, thank you. So now let me get back to where we are. Okay, um, we just did that. We are, okay. The next item on the agenda is review of the Board of Education of Baltimore County public comment and attendance guidelines and procedures. As a reminder, the board discussed this agenda item <laughs> at the, um, we're laughing because we just got a comment that Valentine's Day is a great time to talk about the budget. Well, we're going to be together. We might as well. <laughs> if you want to bring the candy, that's fine. But okay, back. We we'll all wear red, right. Okay, as a reminder, the board discussed this agenda item at the January 10th, 2023 board meeting and postponed it until the January 24th meeting. Five options were provided to board members with recommended changes, which incorporated suggestions from the January 10th meeting. So we had a lot of suggestions. We tasked Ms. Gover with taking our suggestions and putting them into five different options. So I'd like to thank her first for her work on those options um, and sending them to us. So at this time, I will open the floor for discussion on the options that um, were posted. Um, Ms. Dominowski. Can I add mine because it wasn't added? Um, okay, so. Um, you wouldn't, so you go ahead and make your motion. Uh, I move to replace the Board of Education public comment and attendance guidelines and procedures that was made effective August 10th, 2021 until further notice with the following Board of Education Baltimore County public comment and attendance guidelines and procedures. Effective February 14th, 2023 until further notice starting with, um, it's February 14th. 2023 Board of Education public meeting, the board will begin conducting participation by the public portion of the meeting adhering to the fo following guidelines and procedures. Attending the board meeting in person. Any person may attend the board meeting by signing in with a staff member upon entering the building. All persons will be admitted until the meeting room has reached its full capacity under the fire safety code and regulations. Speakers. 
All persons and stakeholder groups are encouraged to address the board of the board by completing and submitting a board meeting public comment registration form. Registration to speak will open one week prior to the board meeting date and close at 11.59 p.m. on the day before the meeting. Public comment is limited to 10 speakers and speakers will be selected by the student board member from a hat of all registration submissions received within the designated time frame. Prior to calling the first speaker, the board chair will again explain the, these meeting procedures for the benefit of the viewing public. If a speaker is selected that is not in attendance, the student board member will select the next speaker until 10 p.m. until 10 public speaker spots have been filled or there are no more registered speakers to call. There will be no option for public comment virtually or by phone. All comments are limited to three minutes per speaker. Time will be monitored using a timer. At the end of the three minute period, speakers will end their comments. Speakers may be interrupted from speaking if they address student or employee matters or comment or matters unrelated to public education in Baltimore County. Any person who is not called to speak or is unable to attend in person can submit their comments in writing to the board by email. All written comments submitted to the board under the same guidance will be posted to board docs for public viewing. All speakers are encouraged to provide feedback on policies, programs, and practices within the purview of the board and school system. The board asks speakers to refrain from addressing specific student or employee matters, matters under appeal or comment, or matters unrelated to public education in Baltimore County. Any inappropriate personal remarks or other behavior that disrupts or interferes with the conduct of the meeting will be deemed out of order. Location. <coughs> One, all Board of Education public meetings will be held at 6901 North Charles Street in Towson, Maryland, except for three out of a fiscal year. Over a fiscal year, board members will select three different locations to hold meetings on three different dates. These locations should be centrally located for persons of all seven districts in Baltimore County. For example, but not limited to the following. Western School of Technology, Sudbrook Magnet Middle School, Locker Even High School, Milford Mill Academy, Carver Center for the Arts and Technology, Overly High School, Eastern Tech High School. Safety procedures. Members of the public are asked to use the appropriate amount of caution if they, are, if they have symptoms of illness. Everyone attending the meeting will sign in with a staff representative. Only persons requesting public comment will be required to register online prior to the meeting. All attempts will be made to allow for the maximum public attendance available at all meetings within the fire code and safety requirements of the meeting room. If the meeting room reaches full capacity, an overflow room will be made available. Is there a second to Ms. Dominowski's motion? Second, Kuhn. Okay, discussion. Ms. Hen. Thank you. Um, I overall I support this motion. I do have a question for Dr. Williams, and that is what is the burden um, slash cost to implement the location um, guidelines of the motion to hold three meetings a year at the various locations? Is there any cost in terms of technology upgrades? And um, can you speak to the staff time and or burden to carry this out to support the board? So I know we dis we reviewed that. I'm looking at communications uh, or Dr. Zarchin, the cost to actually have a board meeting on an another location other than Greenwood. Um, but since no one's moving at this point. <laughs> oh, okay. One moment. Um, and I don't know if this is a full and complete, but Thank you, Ms. I'm Charlie happy Green. to at least attempt to address. Okay, good evening, everyone. Good evening. Thank you, Dr. Zarchin, for joining. I believe we did present, and it may have been an update to the board or weekly communication to the board, at least some rough estimates of the cost of um, moving um, board meeting locations. And so very quickly, if you'll pardon my reading, at a regularly scheduled Board of Education meeting held at Greenwood, two staff from BCPS-TV are assigned to support the needs of the meeting. To support the needs of a meeting held off-site, the number of BCPS-TV staff would likely increase to eight. The number of hours required for BCPS-TV staff to support an off-site meeting would also increase due to the need to transport, set up, and test equipment prior to the meeting. 
direct and support the needs of the meeting while in progress, and break down and transport all equipment at the, um, at the conclusion of the meeting. Half of these staff members are paid hourly and would be due overtime. An approximate cost of overtime for four staff would be $1,500 to $1,700 per meeting. BCPS TV would need to rent equipment such as microphones, cables, soundboard, and an operator. The approximate cost for this equipment rental is $1,700 per meeting. It then goes on to talk about security costs. Um, I can continue to read if, if, if the board will indulge me. Uh, inability to secure a large space with multiple points of entry and egress that might simultaneously be used for other events such as athletics or other extracurricular activities as well as community events create unique problems. There's a difficulty noted in planning for and monitoring people already in a building at the time of a meeting. All of this creates a need for additional security. At least two security officers would be needed at a current cost of $45 an hour. Estimating six hours for each of the four meetings, at the time we were thinking four meetings, would cost $2,160. There's currently no funding allocated to board meeting security. Difficulty in securing the unimpeded arrival and departure board members and the superintendent also can cre uh, create security purposes uh, um, security concerns, rather. And I'm just scanning very quickly to see if there were additional costs. Was there a total for? That no. is all I have okay. on this document. And again, um, this was a previous communication. I certainly can provide a more thorough response, but I think roughly um, those are the costs that we determined right. at the time. And I think we shared this uh, May 20th, 2022 with uh, the board at that time who was looking into this. Dr. Hager, did you have a comment? Um, I did. I, I recall the same conversation, I, and I felt like maybe we had an even deeper conversation in PRC, maybe, mm -hmm. about this as well. Um, and in addition to the significant costs, there were also significant safety concerns. And I was championing this as well. With I know uh, Mr. McMillian was a, a big champion of this. I living in the southwest area, it takes a long time to get to Towson. And so the idea of going to where our stakeholders are, I think is really important, but it just doesn't seem feasible. Um, and again, we I felt like we talked about this a lot over the last year and and, and I was certainly convinced that it's, it's not a feasible option. Um, the other aspect of this uh, proposal that I'm very concerned about is the idea that people would not know ahead of time if they were chosen to speak. Again, it's a really significant commitment for people to, to come to board meetings um, and to also then have to get there way early to get in <laughs> if you're chosen. I, I think that that would really um, deter people who live further away from attending. And I think that's, I, I assume that's a big part of the reason that we're having this discussion is to increase engagement. Thank you. Mr. Offerman, did you have a comment? Yes. Um, I would like to make board members aware uh, excuse me, I'd like to make the new board members aware that we had such problems with security and threats that at times we we had to enter the building from a from a different entrance. My concern of of of, of going to other areas, which is a, it's a fine idea, is I, I I don't I don't see how only having two two security guards would make it possible to be to be secure. And and given the given the way things go in, in the world today, uh, <coughs> I think I think board security has to board and and, and uh, staff security has to be the highest priority. I, I I won't be supporting this. Thank you. Thank you, Maggie. Did you want to, Ms. Demanowski, did you want to speak to your motion? Yes. Um, there were several um, things that went into why I chose this. Um, we have had meetings at George Washington Carver, and uh, BCPS TV was there to cover it. So it's not like that wasn't something that can't be done. This is three meetings out of, I'm like, what, 24? Um, out of the year. I think it's important for us to be near our constituents um, for give them an opportunity to get to be here in Towson. Um, also, as far as security purposes, we're going to schools where our children go to school. So if our children are safe there, we should be safe there. Thank you. Um, Ms. Skover, can you do a roll call vote on Ms. Dominowski's motion? If, if I could just add, because okay. I want to bring us back to a board meeting where we did have some serious concerns about safety. 
uh, the Baltimore County Police Department did an assessment and made some recommendations that were presented to the, the previous full board. Um, and and we, I believe that was put on hold for new board members to consider. It was a time where several board members shared specifically they were concerned about their immediate safety. So I think it would be important to go back and revisit that assessment that the Baltimore County Police Department provided for us and look at possibly getting recommendations if we're going to move the board meetings to schools or other locations. So that has been a, a, a good block of time, but we did have some serious concerns about safety that I, I just don't want us to forget about. Okay. Mr. McMillian. No, okay, Ms. Tim. I just wanted to follow up. I, I totally respect that. This is a new board. I don't have any safety concerns that I'm aware of. I'm more concerned for my students in schools, and um, I, I'm, I just think it's a different board, and I, I don't, I mean, maybe we, it's not the same situation. Go ahead. Uh, in an attempt to cut costs, we've talked about schools have these TV stations set up. And we're talking about renting equipment, uh, transport, transporting equipment. If we look at the schools around the county, and that, those might be some that we focus on, we spent a lot of money over the last number of years building these TV programs, these TV shows, these, the capabilities they have of, of building. I've been in schools where they've done, they do morning announcements, evening announcements. Some of these people the, the, love the opportunity, or at least, uh, people I've spoke to about coming in and having the opportunity to, to do this with their kids and maybe use our people as as you know supervisors or whatever to help them is it going to be a, a, the same quality as what they do here no but but it's a chance of doing that uh, secondly on the on the safety cost of it we have all these school safety people that are in our schools every day you know why can't when we're talking to people why can't we have 20 of those people you know, pull them in. There's going to be a couple assigned to each school. Pull them in from that school, surrounding schools. We could cover every entrance and exit there is, utilizing those people at a reduced cost of $45 an hour there. So I think that we need to go back and revisit this and look at it and seriously, you know, we can cut costs here. And it's not about money. It's about the opportunity to get out and engage other people in the, in the system. Thank you. Ms. Pumphrey, did you want to make a... Uh... I actually um, want to move to amend, but I think we may want to finish this part of the discussion first because my amendment would go would be referring to um, paragraph one and two under speakers and not the paragraph that we're currently discussing. Okay, Ms. Hen. Thank you. Um, I, I support going out in the community. I think as individual board members, we have lots of opportunities to be with our constituents in their locales. Um, Chair Lichter supported us or encouraged us to visit our area advisories and to go to those meetings and to get out and to visit schools, to visit PTA meetings, community meetings. Those are all opportunities that we can take advantage of as board members. Those groups love when we go out and we, I find them to be extremely rich opportunities and that not that we, that this wouldn't be another opportunity, but the risks I question whether the risks are worth the reward and it doesn't it's not going to change the fact of me going out and being in my community talking to stakeholders that's not going to change and it's not putting anyone at risk it's not placing a burden on schools it's not placing a burden on central office staff and I'm sharing that feedback I hear at the full board meeting and bringing that back and echoing the that feedback that I receive as an advocate and as a representative for those communities. So I think this, the end goal, I support that. I think the means is what we're discussing and debating. I think the, the means can be accomplished in a safe way. I've been on the board, this is going into my sixth year. I have had safety concerns. We are not, we are subject to those. We make decisions that are unpopular. Um, unfortunately, that is today's world. And I appreciate the safety uh, measures that Dr. Zarchin spoke to. I appreciate that um, this is a controlled environment. And I would suggest alternative means of reaching out to the community. Last comment, Ms. Hassan. Thank you. So I'll speak to the transportation and the locale um, first. So I, I do agree with the safety concerns. I, um, I experienced sort of that 
from an outside perspective as just a member of the audience, um, I believe last year, um, prior to even being sworn in or becoming an, a candidate and a finalist. So I, I did feel that. And the fact that there were individuals outside of our building banging on windows is not a safe environment. And you know we have this location here for a reason. And I think we shouldn't have to subject all of our schools to that that fear and that stress and that strain because you know as Ms. Hen as you said we have so many opportunities to visit our schools. I know me personally I'm visiting every single middle and high school in BCPS and some elementary schools by the end of my term and I encourage all of you to do the same. I, if you want to amplify student resources and schools and all of these recording studios check out BCPS TV let them know you want to do a segment in their schools because I promise you they will be so eager to see that. Um, so I just think there are other manners to go about this. Um, also the fact that this is a little bit inaccessible to individuals with limited transportation. There are reasons a lot of people pick certain certain board meetings to come and testify, and sometimes it's based on what we're discussing. So the fact that they all have to come and say, okay, well, we might get selected, but if not, we're sitting here until we go home, just isn't fair to people who don't have that regular access to transportation, people who take buses, people who get rides to the board meetings. I know I, I used to be one of those people. Um, so I just think it's not um, entirely equitable. It doesn't consider the fact that our board meetings are five hours long um, and must be recorded. Um, it doesn't consider the fact that, you know, these buildings are utilized for a lot of other spaces. So if we're going to, you know, think about equity, we can think about um, how we can assist in providing transportation to Towson, um, how we can, you know, build that program. But I think it's, it's a little bit inequitable and unfair to, you know, put all of these schools through stress when we have our, we have the responsibility and the capabilities to go out into our communities. Okay, so now at this point, we will vote on Ms. Dominowski's motion. I would, I'd like to move to move to amend. Uh, motion before we vote. Okay, make your amendment. Motion would be to substitute. Oh, I'll second. Do you want me to say it first? Oh, right, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, thank you for your sorry. support, though. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Um, thank you, I Ms. Charlie Green, <laughs> Dr. Zarcha, thank you. I move to substitute, and I hope I do this correctly, I move to substitute um, under speakers paragraph one and two with paragraph from option B, paragraph one and two from option B. Did I say that correctly? So I want to um, substitute paragraph one and two in Ms. Dominowski's motion under speakers to um, paragraph one and two under speakers in option B that was provided previously. So you're adding the idea of continuing the registration for speakers. I'm just making sure that that's the intent of your yeah, motion. Yeah, so the intent is to continue with the online registration and verify and also with the um, first come, first serve wait list okay. available 30 minutes prior to the meeting. Is there a second to Ms. Pumphrey's amendment? I'll second. Okay. Um, okay, now we'll do a roll call vote on the amendment. Correct? Which Can you amendment? read the whole? Ms. What, what are you talking about? What are we talking about? So, um, Ms. Dominowski sent us an email with what she read to us right, about 15 minutes ago. Miss mm -hmm. Pumphrey is making a change to what she sent us. So she is changing the speaker's paragraph one and two which talk about not needing to have the registration to what is on the options that Ms. Gover posted in board docs, she, the first two paragraphs of option B, correct? Correct, if I could just Keep going. Go ahead. clarify. So what you're saying is correct. Um, the, my reasoning is based upon Dr. Hager's recommendation that speakers know in advance if they're selected, also to continue with our electronic sign-up format. That's my um, intention as far as combining um, Ms. Dominowski's request along with option B that we were, pro were provided prior to the meeting. So that's what we're voting on. Could you just read how it would read, so just to clarify? <laughs> just paragraph. So under speakers, it's option B. It would say any person or stakeholder group representative who wishes to address the board must register online. Do you want me to continue? No, 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 no. Okay. Got it. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. 
Um, and before we do a roll call vote, I just want to say one thing that the security we have in schools on a daily basis would not be the security we'd have if we move the board meetings. We have Raptor, we have somebody sitting there, they have to come in. They ha so it's not the same level of safety that we would have if our kids were in the building. Okay, roll call vote on Ms. Pumphrey's amendment to Ms. Dominowski's motion. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Jose? No. Ms. Harvey? No. Ms. Hassan? No. Mr. Offerman? No. Dr. Savoy? No. Dr. Hager? No. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Lichter? No. Favor is five. So the motion does not pass. We will now do a roll call vote on the original motion from Ms. Dominowski. Ms. Before we vote, may I offer an amendment to Ms. Dominowski's? Yes, go ahead. Um, Remember like that we do have five options right here. Okay. I'd like to amend Ms. Dominowski's motion by striking the location section. Okay. So you're looking at her email and you're taking away the whole location center and location section and leaving everything else. Correct. Okay. Roll call vote on. Is there a second? Thank you. Second. Yeah. So if she's taking out, if you look at the email that we, that Ms. Dominowski sent us on Monday, Ms. Hen is proposing that we eliminate speaker section one, two, three, and four. The location section. Oh, I'm sorry. The look, thank you. The location section. One and two. One and two and all the letters. Thank you. Okay. Roll call vote, Ms. Gober. Who seconded? Ms. Dominowski, I believe. Was there a second? Was there a second? Well, that's, she made the motion. Oh, you're amending. Uh, is there a second to Ms. Hen's amendment? Okay, hearing no second. No, there was a second. I think, I think someone. Will somebody second it now if they'd like it second? Okay. No second? Okay, motion, no second, no motion. Okay, we'll now do a roll call vote on Ms. <laughs> Dominowski's original motion which she sent us on Monday. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? No. Mr. McMillian? No. Ms. Hen? No. Ms. Jones? No. Ms. Harvey? No. Ms. Hassan? No. Mr. Offerman? No. Dr. Savoy? No. Dr. Hager? No. Mr. Kuhn? No. Ms. Lichter? No. Favor is one. The motion fails. We are back to the five options that were attached to your do, um, board docs. Yeah. My question is, yes, Ms. Harvey. I'd like to make a motion to adopt option B. Second. Pumphrey, sorry. Do you wish to discuss your motion, Ms. Harvey? Uh, yes, I think that uh, being considerate to people's time. It is important that they know in advance if they are able to speak. However, I do think it is worthwhile to allow people who are coming to fill spaces where speakers don't show up. I think the number 10 for three minutes uh, remains appropriate and therefore I support option B. Can I have a roll call vote on? Motion to amend. Yes, Ms. Dominowski. Uh, I just would like to strike um, no speaker substitutions will be allowed. Two speaker substitutions um, will be allowed if I, um, the one of the ten are not chosen. So is that already an option? It, so well, yeah, I, there's it's very confusing. I'm, it, um, Speaker. Yes, Ms. Harvey. So I would not be in support of that amendment. Substitutions would basically constitute me signing up, for example, and someone coming to speak for me. Rather, if we're allowing for those who come and sign up for a wait list to speak, I think they should have first opportunity. The only problem I have with that is that they're not pre-registered. So why have a registration in the first place? That's all. 
the was it did someone second Miss Harvey's no Miss Dominowski's oh, Ms. I'm, I'm just discussing. Okay. Good. Did you second her? No, I seconded Miss Harvey's. Right. Okay. So, so let's take a have, vote on Miss Harvey's. I think Miss Dominowski was just having a discussion. Was having a discussion right. rather than making right. an amendment. Uh, Okay, oh. we all I'd are. I'd like to make an amendment, potentially. This is Erin Hager. Yes, Ms. Hager, Dr. Hager. Right, thank you. Thank you. Um, my, um, the only change that I, I would like to have to see if the board would entertain would be the possibility of allowing speakers to join virtually from, from option E, merging that line in. Um, so let me make the motion first. I move, I move to um, add the, um, on, on option E under speakers number three, you have that up, add that to option B. There's no wait list for speaker no shows that the third bullet or a different bullet or no, the fourth bullet? Um, sorry, option, option to e. Okay, option E, bullet four. Speaker bullet number three, where it says there will be an option to join virtually or by phone on the online registration form. Yeah, I, I sorry, I'm looking at the summary. It, the summary oh, may sorry. be easy. No, it's oh, fine. Sorry. <laughs> but, okay. Yeah, that line. Okay, so the motion is option B. Is there a as second it, for Dr. Can. Hager's motion? I think we need some clarification on the motion on the, to That's amend. That's fine. Sorry, I was so, speaking so, off, off the cuff here. Sure. So <laughs> op you're suggesting adding option E, speaker number three, to option B. Yes. And what is being deleted from option B? Um, I don't think anything needs no, to be deleted. No, it's just an addition. Nothing? Just, what, just the addition? Okay. It's, it's a replacement. A, a virtual option, essentially. Which is what we did. Oh, sorry. I can speak to it if someone seconds it. Well, option B, number three, says there will be no option to join virtually or by phone. Okay, so strike that and add in um, option E, number three, under speaker. I which I just put in the chat. I'll second that. What did you just second? So I'll second, I'll second Dr. Hager's amendment to strike the line on option B reading. There will be no option to join virtually by phone. So speaker's bullet three to be replaced by option E's speaker bullet three. Does everybody understand what we're about to vote on? <laughs> Thank you. Okay, roll call. Could I speak to it, oh, whoops. Jane? Yes, go ahead, Dr. Hager. J just briefly, um, this is something that we did throughout the pandemic when we were meeting virtually, and it worked quite well. So the the, the operations are in place. Um, and also, this is a topic that we did discuss in the equity committee with the former board, and it is an option that is provided to other, other boards of ed. So I think that it, it's a, a reasonable option for our public as well. Ms. Harvey, did you want to? Oh, I thought you. So actually, you're talking about option E, but taking out the no wait list. Okay. Never mind. Ignore me. Okay. So we're voting on the amendment that Dr. Hager said about option B with adding the virtual or by phone. Okay. Roll call vote, please. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Joes? No. Ms. Harvey? No. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Mr. Offerman? No. Ms. Uh, Dr. Savoy? No. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Favor is eight. So the motion passes. So we have our option. So the motion F. to amend passes, and now we vote on the main motion as amended. Motion to amend. <laughs> okay, say what you said again, Mr. Mercedes. The motion to amend by Dr. Hager passed, so the vote would now be on the Doc, uh, Robin Harvey's, Ms. Harvey's motion as amended by Dr. Hager. So basically it's voting for option B as amended. with the substitution of speaker number three with speaker three option E. I have a motion to 
amend. Ms. Hen. Thank you. I move to amend option B as amended by striking or stakeholder group representative from the speaker's section number one and to develop guidelines and procedures for stakeholder groups. Sure. Point of inquiry, Ms. Uh, Lichter. Yes. For Mr. Brusades, is that a policy decision developing stakeholder um, guidelines, Mr. Brusades? I don't know if it's a policy decision, but I'm, I'm unclear as to whether this means there is something to vote on now or if it's kicking down the road this, uh, this, I, this speaker provision. Like, is, is, the, is there going to be a finalized? Option B, right now, if this, and that, that's just a question for you, Ms. Han. I would be willing to add that these guidelines would be in place for stakeholder groups until the board develops stakeholder group guidelines and procedures. I, I was just asking what, what was actually said. <laughs> I'm, I'm putting it in the chat. Okay. One, one, one moment. The, the I'll repeat I'll repeat it so and then ask for a second. Um, is that okay, Madam Chair? If if it's about stakeholders, then you do have a policy on stakeholders. Right. To develop stakeholder guidelines. Okay. Specifically, and my motion is to amend option B as amended, to strike or stakeholder group representative from speakers number one and for the board to develop stakeholder guidelines. Is there a second? Public comment. There's no second. Thank you. So, yes, Dr. Williams, get us out of this. No. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> Chair, Chair Lichter, now we okay, are back. Now we okay, are back ahead. to uh, Ms. Harvey's motion and um, as amended B. by Dr. As Hager. Amended. As amended. Did you want to say something first? Just an observation. Um, we're trying to do so many things to these options, and maybe you look at one or two things you want to do first. Allow that to play out, and then maybe add on, I will have to say, I understand the need about virtual and phone, but when we had that, it was extremely problematic to manage who's here, okay. who's not here, is a person, on, so I understand the desire, but we, we're, it feels like we're trying to do a lot in this setting and maybe just Back to Ms. Harvey's point, there, we have the five options. Maybe try one and then maybe revisit. But I, I just wanted to offer that. This feels like where we slightly were two weeks ago, making changes and not really understanding what it, what it really means. But I just had to put that piece. Right. Uh, the virtual and was slightly problematic especially with the phones and, and, and all. So I just wanted to bring, it wasn't clean at all, but we did it because we were in the pandemic. Uh, I appreciate that comment for those of us who weren't here when you, we did that. So we are now voting on option B with the amendment, correct? Didn't we already vote on that? No. no. Okay, option B with the amendment of the virtual, adding the virtual or by phone. Okay, Ms. Gover, roll call vote, please. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? <clears throat> yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. Motion passes. Okay, um, <coughs> I would also like to move to amend the agenda to add as a topic the superintendent's search. 
Is there a second to that? Second to that. Okay. Can we have a can we have a roll call vote, please? To amend the agenda to add as a topic the superintendent search. Right now, yes. Call for unanimous consent. Can we have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Jose? Ms. Jose? Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Abstain. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Motion passes. So now I move to make a motion to um, for RFP procurement for superintendent search services. Second. Okay, may I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Hen. Ms. Tomanowski? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Jones? Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. Motion passes. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is information items, which include the financial report for the month ending November 2022, minutes from the November 28th Southeast Area Education Advisory Council meeting. We've been on here too long. My computer won't move. Um, the last item on the agenda is announcements. The board's next meeting will be held on Tuesday, February 14th, 2023 at 6.30 p.m. Did I skip something? Are we good? Oh, agenda setting. Yep. Mm. Um, okay, sorry. Um, so Here I move to postpone agenda setting. Is there a second? Second. Do we need a roll call vote or can we do? I call for unanimous oh, consent. Discussion, Mr. McMillian. I had, an, uh, I had a topic I wanted to bring up that's critical with the budget process. So, okay. You know, so for the, for the next agenda. Okay. Um, then roll call vote. And Ms. Lecter, I'm sorry, who seconded? I thought somebody seconded it. Ms. Harvey, did you second it? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Mr. McMillian? No. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Jose? Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Dr. Hager? No. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. Then, um, wait a second. So with, we just did that one. Sorry. Um, the last item we did that one. It's over, right? <laughs> Where's my thing? Won't move. Okay. The board. Uh, next meeting will be on <coughs> Tuesday, February fourteenth, twenty twenty-three, at six thirty p.m. Thank you for joining us tonight. The meeting is now adjourned. Whoa.